Welcome back to the Hank Strange Situation, Lifestyles of the Locked and Loaded. Bingo. Of Cabot Guns also. Oh, no, put that away. Oh, put that plastic thing away. That is not a real 1911. It's plastic. Oh. You know what a real 19... A Series 70. Series 70 is a good 1911. Even though this is an ugly beater, it still shoots great. <laughs> it's, you guys pack in? Yeah, some crazy... <laughs> <laughs> hey Hank, thanks for having me on. Yeah, we've uh, we've been bumping into each other for years, usually at shows. Uh, I think we met through a mutual friend, uh, Sam Andrews, if I call correctly. Uh, wonderful gentleman. Uh, and just for introduction, uh, Rob Biankin is uh, my last name. Uh, I'm the founder and uh, CEO of uh, Cabot Gun Company. We're a small boutique manufacturer. And uh, my associate here, who's also Rob, is uh, Rob Shawland. And uh, Shawland is a master gunsmith. So figured you got both, you know, the business end, the technical end, and we can cover a wide range of uh, topics and, you know, feel free to go if you want. You know, Hank has no, Hank has no sound. I can hear you. Yep. At Babyface, Hank has no sound, probably because you're trying to mess with your, your video stuff. Because we can hear you. I bet you your audio is coming through. We're looking at your other video. So for anybody out there that's listening that can actually hear me and not Hank, Hank has been messing with a new camera setup. Instead of using his old setup, he wants to use his Canon and a microphone. So it's probably he's probably not pushing the correct audio through. So give him a second. We'll figure it out. Sure. Um, so so do you guys want to go by, what was it, R1 and R2? Sure. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> can the people um, hear me now? I'll be R1. R one, yeah. Yeah. How did um, how did you guys get into the nineteen eleven market of all things? What what drove you to the nineteen eleven market to to build high end? For anybody who's out there that doesn't know, Cabot guns are not your run of the mill nineteen eleven. They are fancy, fancy, fancy nineteen elevens. Well, it, it happened a little bit by accident. It wasn't really a planned business to start out with. So I think it was back in two ten. Uh, 2010, you know, I, I really just wanted to have a high-end 1911. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, 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 I came into guns really as an adult. I was telling Hank before, I grew up in Canada, and, uh, you know, when I moved to the U.S., married an American, and, uh, you know, guns are ubiquitous here. Oh, yeah. And, you know, when I got into guns, it's kind of like a fish to water. It's was, it was fascinating, <laughs> right? You know, you know, you put a big, you shoot machine guns at rental shops. Uh, but when I got down here, I had a lot of friends that were very promiscuous with their guns, quick exposure to it. Um, and I was surprised once I started learning about guns, um, and particularly the 1911, which is the iconic American gun, mm -hmm. uh, that they were still built the same way. 
after a hundred years. And uh, it just seems to me that with today's capability of very high precision modalities, there could be a different way to approach construction. So the concept was, okay, after a hundred years, how can you look at an object and say, is there a new process? Is there a better way to make this iconic American object? And the idea was uh, uh, fairly simple. Uh, the philosophy is a gun is the sum of its parts. The higher the tolerance parts, the better machine works. And that's an engineering truth. It doesn't matter whether it's a jet engine or a pistol. Um, and what the industry had done, just so people have a frame of background, it was generally 911 components and pistol components in generally are made to low tolerances. Mm. And then a very capable gunsmith like uh, Rob Shalland, who came from a gunsmithing background, uh, they have to take those parts and alter every one of them or most mm -hmm. of them to have the gun fit very tightly together. And so uh, you don't have to do that. You can make every part to a very high precision standard so it kind of engages together like a Swiss watch. And when you feel a gun that's high tolerance like that, doesn't have contact points like traditional guns, you know, it's like the first time you drive a nice car. You can feel it in the action. You can feel it when you shoot it. It's a thing of beauty. So uh, we started out by engaging uh, uh, the aerospace industry and said, great, you know, can we, can we draw out all the components, build them to very higher splitting precision, and then fit them together uh, without traditional gunsmithing? And that's what we did out of the gate. Mm -hmm. Now, I wanted a gun for myself and maybe thought we could make some for some friends. And uh, so it didn't start out as a business idea. It started like, hey, you know, can we build a small number of guns? And then shortly after that, it's like, okay, there's a business opportunity. So it was the process of how you build something leads to the nature of what it can become. And simply the process of building that, and we can get into that later, uh, is far more costly because it's a, it's a different process. And it, quite frankly, it's much, much harder than traditional gun building. Okay. So we got started back in... You know, in 2011, uh, we debuted at the Pittsburgh NRA show, and within six months for that, you know, boom, you know, it was all in. Let's give it the shot, and uh, here we are, 2019. Nice. Wow. Yeah, how long, I'm sorry, I was going to say, how long ago was that? Mostly I'm testing to see if anyone can hear me right now. They can hear you. They already mentioned oh. that they can okay, hear you. Okay, cool. All right, good, good, So good, 2011, good. how? 2011, uh, okay. How hard is it to make something in that market? I mean, how, how marketable is how how well do high end nineteen eleven sell? I, I guess I've heard people like loving their high end nineteen eleven, so I guess there's a pretty good market for it. But I know you guys make some like not just like thirty five hundred dollar guns. You guys make some crazy stuff, like bespoke shotgun level nineteen elevens, right? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of mythology, and we can dispel all of it today. <laughs> uh, now, uh, Cab, we are a boutique producer. Mm -hmm. So uh, to make guns like we do, you have to control everything. It's the only way to do it. And so we're also vertically integrated. Uh, but the, um, uh, it's, it's, it's a niche market to be sure. Mm -hmm. And so by industry standards, we are very, very small. Uh, but, you know, uh, the thesis at the beginning, because there was no case study, all right, you know, I remember when we, we debuted, we had guns at $5,000. And at that time, that was a lot of money for a 1911. And people were like, I don't get it, right? And, and it's kind of hard to explain on a soundbite why it costs more to make a 1911 by the, uh, in that way. And, uh, you know, and I was kind of pissed at the time because, you know, as a new American, like, I, you know, I, I took, I, you know, I think my DNA was always American, by the way. But, you know, I loved art, you know, I love technology. I love guns. I became an American because of the Constitution. And it made me mad that like, if you wanted the finest shotgun in the world, you have to go to Italy. You have to go to Germany. You have to go to London. And it seemed to me like, why are we not making very, very high quality uh, guns here? So, uh, at the, so there's no case study to look in the handgun market. Will somebody pay, at the time, $5,000, which that's just a... That was just a function of what how they what they cost to build, and then it was well, will they build, you know will somebody buy a ten thousand dollar gun, and a twenty five thousand dollar gun, and a fifty thousand dollar gun, and a hundred thousand dollar gun, right? And so the whole case study and my basic my basic thesis is, you know, I love beautiful guns, and you know if you like nice guns and you own a nice watch, 
well, maybe you can buy, spend five, ten, twenty thousand dollars on a gun. And so it was a belief in something where there wasn't really a case study to look at, but just something like, you know, I, I kind of wanted to do. And then I tested to see if there was demand. And fortunately, there was enough, you know, to, to get us going and, and to build us a modest business. Okay, um, cool. What? So what would differentiate between a, like a basic, I'd say basic, but like a $3,500 gun? Like, I think you guys have the S100, T100? I can't remember. I, I just looked at the website. What would differentiate between like that level, that tier, and like a $50,000? Is it just materials used? Uh, yeah, well, uh, the foundational building block of every gun, you know, firstly is, uh, you know, here's a Whoa. steel, right? And so... One thing that's unique on how we build a gun compared to anybody else uh, in the industry is that, um, you know, we don't work with a casting. Even a forging is a shortcut in our view. So a tool maker making a, you know, a critical component uh, for a high tolerance need would start with a block of steel. So that's what we do. So the receiver, in fr and uh, for example, in the slide, uh, we make in-house, we make small parts. And so get, to give you an example, I mean, you can buy a casting to make a gun, which, which you'll find on a, on a low end, not a low end, a typical 1911, right? You can buy them, and they come from overseas, and they cost, well, I won't say how much, very, very little money. You would mm -hmm. be mm -hmm. and then to, And then typically what other people in the industry do is they'll buy a receiver that's 80% made in, I don't know, Korea, you know, Korea from Dasan or something. They'll machine rails and they'll, instead of saying made in America, it's finished in America. Mm -hmm. And I said, no, no, no. You know, one of the fundamentals of Cabot was I wanted a made in America product that was really made in America. And I mean from scratch. So even this, the steel that we source, we use the Buy American Act. You know, I wanted all, all American. Uh, but, you know, if you're going to make a component from a block of steel, this is an enormous cost differential versus starting from uh, another method. It's the hardest way to do it. Uh, is it overkill? Yeah, probably. But <laughs> that's what America's all about. That's that's right. That's what we're doing. <laughs> why, like, why can't you do it that way? Yeah. You know? That's, and it's that's not, what it's, America it's, means in. Uh, it's not the best business model to, to like make things the most expensive way possible. Uh, but fortunately, you know, there's a sliver of people out there that don't care. You mm -hmm. know, they want it made in that fashion, and you know, we we found that small niche in the market. Yeah. So um, I'd like to get I'd like to get Rob Shalland in on here. So Rob, like, who are you? How did you wind up meeting? Are, are you also from Canada, by the way? <laughs> let us know now. I'm from the communist state of Illinois. Oh, oh boy, I don't know which ones. Okay, I think you I think you got I think you got Rob beat. <laughs> Put the gun turrets up and the fencing. So I just snuck out mm -hmm. and I uh, got out to join Cabot, but. Uh, my ride in the gun business kind of started at a very young age. Uh, 19 years old, I started at Springfield Armory okay. uh, on the 1911 line. And back in those days, we had a blued or a parkerized 45. That your choice. Yeah. And I kind of started in that area, and I was also working on a uh, Tanfolio CZ75 style pistol they were building at the time called the P9. And I thought that that gun was it. And when I looked at the 1911s, I thought, who would want to buy that old dinosaur? Who wants that crap? Mm -hmm. That's like so old. That looks like my grandpa's gun. And here I am 30 years later now <laughs> um, after working for Les Bear, uh, working for okay. Armalite of all places, um, and then having my own custom shop and now to Cabot. Okay, so Armalite. There, uh, there were no Armalite 1911s that I know of. No, no. I worked on okay. AR there a little bit. Got okay. a little bit of experience with that. Okay, cool, cool. So, um, so yeah, so in the beginning you're saying like these 1911s, you thought they were like for old fogies? Yeah, I so, thought that, I honestly thought that the 1911 was just going to kind of fade and go away. Okay. <laughs> High capacity 9mm was where it was at. Mm -hmm. And also around the same time, I saw my first Glock, mm -hmm. and I was like, what is this thing? Mm -hmm. And I was kind of stumped by it, but I kind of saw, like, where it was heading, you know, and I thought the 1911 was just going to go by the wayside. 
Okay. I mean, it's interesting. There's lots of companies out there making 1911. I mean, in the gun world, there's companies making lots of things. I think most people are making AR-15s. Then you, you, there's a lot of AR-15s and 1911s. Sure. Right. That doesn't make everything um, all equal. This is something I want to ask, um, you know, both of you guys. What, uh, you know, what's the prototype of your customer? Like, who do you see that buys Cabot guns? What it's, does that person a, look uh, like? Yeah, it, it's actually, uh, uh, there's a range. I mean, typically it's the person who's probably older than 35. Typically, I would say 45 or older. Uh, you know, they, obviously they have to have disposable means to be able to buy an upper end pistol. So a lot of you know younger people are precluded by that. Not all. Um, quite often, they are small business owners or 1911 enthusiasts, and um, and they range quite a bit. 25 percent of our business is outside the U.S. and it has been since very early on. So we cater to you know some. Uh, uh, fairly high level collectors um, who, you know, they're looking for something unique, something exclusive, and uh, rare materials. And so it, it's a very dispersed market. You know, it's not like we look, okay, you know, Texas, that's where all our sales are, Florida. I mean, it's, it's really dispersed all around the country and all around the world now, surprisingly. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um so uh, do you have some celebrities in there or that's not like a big part of the of your market you think uh yeah no no we have we have uh, you know quite a few high profile um clients you know some are very public about their ownership mm -hmm. uh some are private but yeah no no all kinds of uh uh you know, highly visible people that you would recognize from you know actors uh musicians uh uh politicians mm -hmm. uh it really brand, uh, you know, broad spectrum. You know, there's quite a few celebrities that have been very public about their uh, enthusiasm for Cabot guns, and you know, as a small company, that, that's kind of like a godsend, you know, mm -hmm. because you, know, you, you can't kind of buy that, and they got a lot of visibility and a lot of prestige. And uh, you know, I've been fortunate. Like we've had a lot of folks that you know they've looked at a small business, and and you know, when they buy a gun from us. Uh, I mean, if anybody buys a gun from us, it's not a commodity transaction. So, you know, I'm, we're building something that is, one, a very highly personal object. But two, you know, if I'm making it for you, that's a, that's a very tight relationship. And in one way, you know, we're, we're building dreams. We're building, more often than not, a gun that's not going to be disposable. It's going to be a gun that will be around for your lifetime, your child's lifetime, their child's lifetime. So it builds also a very unique relationship with people that uh, uh, is a real French benefit of, 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 of the job for sure. Okay. So, you know, it, it, it gets quite interesting. Oh, okay. It's, it's kind of cool knowing, like, buying something that where you know the person making it. Like, this is the gunsmith. He's going to make your gun. He's the only person that's going to touch it. This is your gun. Like, there's something neat about that, I think. Yeah. yeah. It, it, in, in our case, I mean, it, it's far deeper than that. You know, typically, if you have, you know, one gunsmith, they're, they're sourcing components, right? And then they're putting them together. And we get a pallet of steel. shows up in the corner of the shop. That's it. We make everything, you know? And, like, there's very little we don't make. You know, we make, uh, there's 31 unique components uh, that, are, that are on a Cabot 1911. And that is a whole different prospect. You know, that takes, like, building from scratch to a whole new level. And it's unique, you know. Nobody else uh, out there does it like that. You know, there's an efficiency reason why they don't. Uh, but it, it is a quest. I mean, it's a, it's a goal. How do you make a more perfect 1911? So it's a philosophical challenge. It's a technical challenge. And uh, you know, it's, then you know, once we engineered a pistol that performed at a very high standard, and I just want to emphasize that because, like, you know, I, f I feel sometimes we get discriminated against. You go, wow, you got a beautiful gun, do they shoot, right? And like, no, 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 you don't understand. The first step was making a gun that would perform at the highest level possible. And like our guns are using competition, by the way. Mm -hmm. I mean, who's going to, so I don't, I don't know, this is, this is maybe me, but yeah. who the hell is going to spend that kind of money and then not shoot it? You'd be surprised. <laughs> you, well, I, I, it does not compute in my brain. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's, it's all relative. Like, you know, yeah. it's, it's a collector, right? Okay. Uh, and I have guys that will buy 
two ten thousand dollar pistols with the exact same one. Mm-hmm. One shoot, well, one just, put in their uh, collection. Okay. Yep. Because you know, when somebody's buying a very high end pistol, they're also looking at it as a store of value, mm-hmm. considering future resale. And with with those elements in mind, those in the business uh, who do that tell me that the condition of the gun is critical. Okay. If it's pristine, it it uh, it's, uh, has a higher resale value. And by the way, you know, we have guns we've made in the past that sell for more than what we sold them for at the time. And you know, quite often with the custom work, for example, um, you know, for you know, if you call me up and say, "Hey, I want to I want a custom mirror image pistol set," you know, rare materials, you know, crazy grips, etc. It might take you a year or longer for us to deliver that. And so uh, it's happened multiple times where, like, okay, we have a number of projects in queue. And then I have somebody who calls me, like, I want one next month. I go, well, you know, we, we don't do magic, right? You know, there's a process. And so quite often, you know, somebody can commission a set of pistols for, say, $25,000. And then I'll call up another customer who has a set being re- that will be ready next month. Say, hey, you know, I have somebody who wants one now. Okay, they'll pay thirty-five or forty thousand dollars, right? You know, we'll split we'll split the difference over twenty-five. The guy who wants it quicker has it, you know, and, and somebody maybe doesn't want, mind going to the back of the line and waiting in queue. So sometimes a little bit of arbitrage, and uh, you know, when you get to very high circles, I mean, people want what they want, and then you know, the price becomes a little less critical, you know. Mm-hmm. So delivering time or quality, and we can't do both. But the quality takes time, and there's not a shortcut to do it. <laughs> yeah. That's, um, that, you know, so what's the percentage of people that are, excuse me, <clears throat> what's the percentage of people that are custom ordering their, their gun versus, I mean, can, is, can anyone just come on there and go, okay, I see this gun on the website, I want that, or is everyone, you know, making a custom gun? Yeah, so uh, this is how it works. So uh, we have a standard product lineup, mm-hmm. and from that it starts from, you know, $3,600 on up. And, you know, you can look at a menu of pistols, right? And, the, and every pistol will have a menu of options that you can customize with, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, so that's one level of custom uh, gun you can build. And then what we have is our Oak grade or Oak collection. And Oak is an acronym for one of a kind. And mm-hmm. so you can come to me and say, I want a gun, something that has never been done before, something that's never been tried, mm-hmm. with no one's attempted for and you know we can create that for you okay anything and that's and that's what we call our oak grade and that is where like you know okay you go from you know the you know regular guns can be 3600 to maybe fifteen thousand dollars and oak grade pistols uh you know they might start at 15 to twenty five thousand dollars for a single pistol and then go up from there exponentially now uh one question you asked earlier about the difference between a you know, thirty-six hundred dollar gun and a fifty thousand dollar gun is after um, that four thousand dollar base of construction, right? Then it's always materials, materials and finishing, and the sky's the limit. It's imagination, right? And so a lot of time you're creating, you know, like the concept, and you know it's really fun. We have clients that are very engaged in participating in the creative aspect. And then we have other other clients that, you know, they will um, give quite a bit of trust. And like, you know, that, hey, I got an idea. I'm like, what is it? Can I explain it? Do you have a picture? Now, what's going to cost? Like, I don't know, more than the last one. Okay, go for it, right? And so you build a little bit of relationship, but you have to deliver. And you have to over-deliver. Um, uh, so there's different ways that it can be, uh, uh, yeah, that you, you can go. Um, finishing is uh, more art, although there's technical aspects to it. And that's something, you know, that you evolve and adapt. Uh, for example, uh, we've been doing quite a bit of work in Damascus Steel. Mm-hmm. Uh, back in 2013, we did our first pistol with, with an artisan uh, upper. And at that time, it was, the first, uh, it was the first 1911 with an artisan Damascus uh, 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 upper on a, on a, on a 1911. And uh, that gun set a record for the highest price sold. Uh, guns, handgun souls that was not engraved. But from then to now, we've learned an immense amount of finishing. And so the steel itself is one starting point, but what you can elicit from the material in terms of contrast, depth, uh, is quite spectacular. And it's very, very time consuming. You know, it becomes an art. 
And, you know, so, I mean, we're a small company, 16 people all together. Uh, but we have multi, a multi-discipline team. So that's the key. You know, I mean, it's really a team effort with a lot of different specializations. You know, um, my business part, part, uh, uh, partner, Mike, who joined me after my second year, uh, is a high-level uh, engineer. Uh, uh, Rob, who's on this uh, call with us or this uh, talk with us, is a master gunsmith from a gunsmithing background. Uh, we have tool makers, machinists, and it's a combination of really uh, a, a varied amount of skills, but at e but each person at a really high level of capability within that skill set. So we're just lucky. I mean, it, it's really a team effort of what we do, and you know, we try to sit back. There's no ego involved. It's like, okay, great. How do we do this better? How do we make this spectacular? How do we do what hasn't been done before? Yeah. And so it's a fun journey in that regard. Yeah, so it sounds like you guys enjoy people, um, you know, calling up and going, hey, I want this crazy thing. Uh, I'm going to ask Robert Shalland, what's the craziest thing you've, since you've been there, you know, craziest request you've seen come into Cabo Guns? That's a tough one. They're all so crazy, man. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Just did one with uh, some Tamascus grips. Um and a full um, hand-forged Damascus upper and lower, but then they wanted the upper and lower DLC'd. So to get some contrast still in the material, you have to etch it deep enough to be able to polish the high spots in the steel and then leave the lower spots in a duller finish so that you have contrast to the finish and it doesn't look like it's all one color. That's probably the most insane one I've seen in a while. Yeah, and I mean, it's, this is not the... That, that pistol set that Rob's talking about, for example, that's something we recently finished. And that is taking the finishing of that material to a place like I, I, we didn't even know it was possible. Uh, I've never seen anything like it before. Um, we're getting photography in the next couple of weeks that will be uh, you know professional that we can show. The client hasn't seen it yet. Um, but with that set of guns, and so from that first gun where we did an upper, we've now done pistols that are upper, lower, and we've done pistols that are uppers, lowers, all s small parts, practically all small parts, and even the right and left, because we make a left-handed gun, which is unique in the industry, too. Uh, yeah, but the uh, the finishing now that we've taken Damascus to, which has not been seen, you'll see in about a month, uh, I think it's the most beautiful thing we've ever done. I mean, it's, it's, it's breathtaking. It's, it's one of these things that you look at and... Uh, it makes your heart beat faster. It, okay. It's truly a thing of beauty. Is um? Do you guys have? Is it? Is the Dante's Inferno from you guys? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Lewis nineteen eleven. He's saying the Dante's Inferno. So that's his. Yeah. Comment. Uh, one of my favorite guns ever, and uh, yeah. uh, long journey there. Uh, that's engraved by master engraver uh, Lee Griffith. Mm -hmm. And you know Lee Griffith is a. Uh, I mean, he, he, he's a remarkable talent, but he's a really fascinating, interesting guy as well. Mm -hmm. uh, he has a uh, seven, eight-year uh, wait list. He really has three patrons that have him booked in perpetuity. Oh. Uh, you know, I, I met Lee at a safari club show. We were both there at a Griffin and Howe booth, and Lee had a rifle there. I, I didn't know who he was, but, you know, I was looking at the rifle, and, you know, Griffin and Howe, they have... Boss, Purdy, all the great European engravers, and you know, the engraving on, on Lee's shotgun, the subject matter was unique. The technique was unique. There are elements in it that I'd never seen before. So, you know, mm -hmm. just hang on a week, and Lee, what's this? So he starts explaining it to me, and uh, I'm, not, I, I'm not an engraving expert. I know more now than I did then. Uh, but you can tell when you see something that is extraordinary, and... Uh, uh, Lee's work was is truly unique. And later during that same weekend, I bumped into uh, a fellow who publishes a book on engraving. And he asked me, hey, you know, and I asked him, hey, have you heard of this guy? And he starts laughing at me. He goes, oh, please. Lee's probably the number one guy in the world right now. You know, because, you know, his range from Bolino to deep relief engraving at a technical level, uh, I can only describe as the hand of God. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, Lee didn't start engraving until he was 40 years old. Wow. What? So yeah. he was a he's a potato farmer. 
right? <laughs> okay. Had a, had a, had a, had a neighbor uh, approach him, say, hey, Lee, I know you're artistic. Lee likes to draw and paint. You know, can you engrave a knife I made? Maybe we can get a bit more money for it. And Lee says, I don't know anything about engraving. And uh, so typical to Lee, uh, you know, he couldn't afford the $300 to buy engraving tools. So he, from old farm implements and screwdrivers, he made his own engraving tools. Okay. He's the right guy to stabilize that. And, and so for 10 years, he farmed from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. at night. And then he engraves from 8 p.m. till 2 in the morning. Yeah. Uh, people don't do that kind of stuff anymore. <laughs> yeah. And 10 yeah. years later, you know, he was awarded the mas Master Engraver from the Firearms Engravers Association. And, uh, you know, once in a while, a guy comes along who has the hand of God. And uh, uh, I'm told by very credible sources, he may be a better oil painter than he is engraver. So, uh, yeah, no, he's, he's amazing. Yeah. We we were very lucky to, uh, I got to know him, and you know, I didn't think he'd ever do a pistol for us. And I go, Lee, would you ever think about it? And like, kind of, he goes, yeah, yeah, I'll do it. And so, you know, the Dante concept is something I wanted to do for a long time. And then we focused on two different contos of, of Dante. And uh, uh, it's a museum grade pistol without a doubt. I mean, it's spectacular. If, if someone has not seen it, it's, it's worth taking a look at it on our website. I, um, for anybody out there, I just linked uh, Lee Griffith's Facebook page where he has all of his engravings. They're amazing. They're incredible. Yeah. <laughs> like, and, this is art. <laughs> yeah, and the, his, the photography that he has doesn't do it justice. Mm. Uh, you know, to see it in person is you know, is, is quite arresting. Oh, yeah. here, here's the one for the Dante's Inferno. Wow, that's amazing. You can literally just look at the grips on that pistol and get lost in that grip. With and you walk away and you'll come back and you'll see something that you didn't see when you were just there looking at it. This that, yeah, uh, I feel like this should be like hanging on a wall or something. Yeah, I'm scrolling through. Uh, I put up the I put up the Facebook page so you guys can see what it looks like for this anyone out there that wants to go um, take a look at it. And yeah, then it's amazing it, for some and and he's only been doing this ten years. No, no, he's longer now. So now now he, oh. he's he's at a point where he, he engraves full time. But in his journey to get there is, you know, one of the great stories about personal perseverance and determination. And I just have a great admiration uh, for that. Uh, you know, and he's a humble guy, too, you know, very rigid, straight laced. And but, you know, he he's productive he's, even as an engraver, because in, you know, a lot of engravers are artists as well. And so in the creation of arts, there's a lot of ups and downs and emotion. Uh, but Lee's disciplined, like at 6 a.m., he's at his bench still. You know, six a.m. starts. He, he works ten hours a day, so you know, he'll he'll have a body of work out there. Most of it's going to be in private hands, unfortunately, but he has he'll have a a, a body of work. Because I think before a guy like Lee, you know, maybe the fracassis in Italy, they were not, you know perhaps the best, right? And I love the fact that we have a guy like Lee here in the U.S., an American, who's doing work that is at the highest level of engraving, you know on yeah. par with everything that had been done historically. Yeah, so let me ask this question, because um, I, I think a lot of people will probably relate to this. Let's say there's folks out there and they want to get into some aspect of this industry, like engraving or, you know, doing what Rob does, uh, being a gunsmith, et cetera. How, how do people, you know, from you guys' point of view, how do people get into the industry? Or two, you want to take that first? <laughs> you know, I've always told people, because I get asked all the time, um, probably the best thing for you to do is to, if you're close enough, now proximity starts to come into play. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen, I've seen good things come out of some of the gunsmithing schools like the Colorado School of Trades. Um, but I tell people, go work for a gun company, you know, go get a job at Les Bear Custom or Nighthawk or any of the higher end 1911 brands, or even one of the major manufacturers so that you can learn the basic, you know, here's how you assemble it, here's how you take it apart, here's how you troubleshoot, and then you can kind of move from there once you really pick up everything about certain aspects of the 1911 specifically. Okay, so, so if you, let's say you go to those guys, what are they gonna be looking for uh, so far as qualifications? 
You know, yeah. uh, do, do they just hire anyone that comes in the door? Do you have to have military experience? Like, what's the thing? It really depends on the business that we're talking about. Um, absolutely, there are companies that do love to hire people with no experience because they have no previous bad habits and they want to teach them and train them the way they like it done at their shop. Okay. Um, you know, it's just one of the things, Les Bear's notorious for that. Um, he will occasionally hire people from gunsmithing schools, but he prefers that somebody have maybe a little mechanical aptitude, but not really have an idea of, you know, what a 1911 is and how it works because he wants to teach them the way he wants it done. Okay. That makes sense. That that sounds uh, counterintuitive, but it actually it makes sense to me. Yeah, you know, he doesn't want the bad habits. And and there can be some, and it just depends on the company and what extent they do work. I mean, the extent that Les Bear does work, as far as hand fitting goes, is higher than anyone else in the industry. They do more hand fitting than anyone, hands down. Oh, okay. So if someone's out there and they're kind of like worried about about that, like approaching a manufacturer or something, they shouldn't be? Is that what you guys are saying? I'd say don't be scared. You okay. know, email your resume, let it go. You know, nothing ventured, nothing gained. Yeah, yeah. So, so Robert, is the industry hiring now or how does that look for you guys? Are you guys cutting back, hiring? What's going on there? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're not we're not the perfect bellwether for the industry, right? Because, you know, by default, we kind of fit in the luxury market. And, you know, so, you know, it, we're not able to scale, you know, production to giant levels mm -hmm. and not what we do. Um, but we're in a stabilized industry. So, you know, you know, four or five years ago, it was an abnormal market. Uh, you know, but, you know, guns aren't going anywhere. The, the, the industry will be here. But people ought to be mindful you know, the industry and gun companies have big names, but it's a small industry. So the civilian uh, uh, firearms and ammunition market is much, much smaller than people think it is. So uh, that entire market is something like 10 or $12 billion. And that includes ammo for the civilian market. The firearm portion of that is maybe about $5 billion. And, you know, to put in perspective, you know, and people think, oh, it's a giant industry, there's a lot of money in it. It's not. It's a very competitive industry. Um, gun buyers are probably the most knowledgeable consumer, <laughs> you know, yeah. as you guys can appreciate, right? Yeah. You know, and YouTube doesn't help. <laughs> yeah. So what, what I think is absolutely true, like if you're in this, if you're working in this industry, you're working in this industry because you want to. Like, so you have to have a passion for you want to be making, you know, guns or, or doing something within the Second Amendment or industry or farm and industry. And uh, and so there's some limitations. And so if your goal is like, I want to make the most amount of money possible uh, for everybody out there, the gun industry is not the best course to do that. There's higher uh, return on investment on, you know, as a business, I, you know, there's other things I could I, I could be doing that is more lucrative than making guns. Yeah. You know, I'm happy to turn a dollar and you know make something that'll be around for generations. It's very you know rewarding to me personally. Um, but there's opportunity for sure. Uh, somebody needs to identify the area that they're interested in, interested in within the firearms market. There's a there's a real broad range of of, of uh, work within the firearms industry. Everything from training, manufacturing, to the components, to gun building, to gunsmithing. Um, and it's a process, you know, if you go into it prepared, your first three years is almost like, okay, you have to go into it thinking long term, and this is what you want to be doing. And, you know, as an employer, I, as a small employer, and I think it applies for any small business, you want somebody who, one, um, has a work ethic, right, somebody who's reliable, and then you want, and then you want somebody who's going to show up early, you know, the guy who doesn't make excuses, somebody who comes to you and, you know, just doesn't want to be good. They want to be better. And then when they're better, they want to be the best, right? And so like anything else, I think the path to having a fulfilling career in the industry is it's a journey, right? It's going to take a number of years for anybody junior to get into it. Uh, but, you know, you, you can make a, a, you can make a modest to decent living uh, over time, you know, if you specialize and focus uh, and, and, and you work. But, uh, you know, I'm not, you know, but we're not the perfect bellwether. And I, I don't, you know, I, we're not typical to the industry. 
Uh, but I think that you know it's good general advice uh, for anybody out there. Yeah. So let's say there's a young guy out there, you know, um, and he wants to maybe not work for someone, but he wants to start his own business doing what you're doing. What would you guys recommend versus the guy, you know, like the guy who wants to come work for someone and work their way up? Want me to go first, Rob? Go ahead. Yeah. Don't do it. Run away. Don't. <laughs> Run away. <laughs> Go work for someone else. Let them worry about where the paycheck comes from and who's paying the light bill and who's paying the rent. Oh, okay. That's my and I yeah. owned a business. You owned a business. Okay, yeah. I think that's because, oh. uh, I mean, I was asking for a friend, not me. Actually, <laughs> like Babyface, for example, works in other industries. But I know, right, Patrick, you're very interested in maybe one day this is what you would like to do, work in the firearms industry, right? Some Building something. I'm not sure what quite yet. Um, I'm... But build, yeah, I'm. I've always been the type that likes building things. Um, so building something is what I'd like to move into at some point. I just got to find what my ni my niche is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I'll I'll take the opposite approach, approach yeah. from our and and you know certainly, you know, it being a technician or a gunsmith or a master builder, um, making something is different from you know running a business, and so you know you kind of have to learn both. If you want to, if you want to do both, um, you know, the different pressures. You know, if, mm -hmm. if you, you want to start a business, okay, it, it's not you're not you don't walk out at the end of the day and it ends, right? It's twenty four seven. It takes commitment, uh, but that's the American dream. You know, look at me. You know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an immigrant, right? A guy who came here, right? Got into firearms. Like you know, I like to maybe build a gun, have a gun built a certain way and then build it into a business mm -hmm. um, but it's a process it's a sacrifice there's no easy way to do it you know i think you know the old uh advice where like find something you're really passionate in right and you know with enough time and determination uh you know you'll find you, you'll find a path and what were you a, what were you yeah. making in canada just out of curiosity i'm sorry i didn't mean to cut you off there but something yeah. in my brain says, what was Robert Bianchin making in Canada? Yeah, no, I, I was an academic. So Maple syrup. Yeah, I know. Yeah. My, my brain was thinking he was going to say babies, making babies. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I, I, though my background was, you know, more on the academic side. I, my okay. background as, you know, as an economist and then in the U.S., I worked for a, a Swiss bank for a short while. But, you know, I'll tell you, there's a big difference in, like, working in a service. Right, well, right now, like, we... Half of society, Wall Street's like inventing money, right, and services, right. But there's an extraordinary satisfaction about actually making a tangible good. You know, boom, you put that on the table. Like, look mm -hmm. at that. You, know, you look at something. You created something at the, at the end of the day, and you have to know what your goals are. So, you know, your path will depend on what your personal goal, goals are, on what you want to achieve, and more importantly, like, okay, okay, what constitutes a meaningful life? Mm -hmm. These are these are bigger questions, right? Mm -hmm. And you know, for me, you know, being in the gun business is more than just a gun. It's you know it, what it represents. It's the philosophy, mm -hmm. you know, the identity of what created America. You know, um, and it's turned out to be a wonderful palette, you know, for creativity and expression too. So you know, there, there's larger questions that you know we have to answer individually as to you know what that goal is. But at the end of the day, you know, being su successful or, or making it in a business to some extent uh, will be determination. And uh, but there's no, but you know, you can study a lot, you can read a lot about you know, business and strategies and marketing and and operating. Uh, but you know, usually it, it, it all starts with an idea and find something that you think is unique. The in, the firearms industry, the large industry, is very competitive, so. You have to find some area where it's a it's a niche, in my opinion, if you're starting a business, because you're never going to compete with a foreign uh, producer. You're not going to compete with a billion dollar conglomerate. So you got to find something different and something unique, and then you might have a small path to build a business on. Okay, very good. Now I'm gonna t I'm gonna do some questions. I'm gonna go to this one because he gave us two bucks. So Richard Hughes says, um, R1 and R2, do you own a high point? Which, which before you guys, before you guys re re respond to this, um, 
answer that, but also this. What other guns do you own from from people other than than the ones that you guys manufacture? I I, I think Robert Bianchi doesn't even know what a high point is. <laughs> yeah. How do you say that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I do. Yeah. And no, I don't own a high point. Sorry. Okay. Did nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with I've that. I've only heard good about the company, though, when they yeah. were in business. Everybody would tell me how they stood behind the product, so I can't say anything negative about them for sure. Yeah, High Point's still out there. They're still making guns. You know, it's a completely different scale. I think this is like one of the things that Robert was just talking about. High Point specializes in making like the most affordable guns possible in polymer. You know, there's some there's some guys that make some some other stuff, but that's what they do. Uh, what so what about you, uh, Bianchin? Have you you do, do, you know, never heard of high? Yeah. There's probably no high points in your safe. Way, that's I guess. legit, man. I mean, you know, if you need a gun to take care of yourself and your family, and you can afford a high point, you know, you know thank God there's a high point out there. Amen. But, you know, Good answer. It really is. I mean, yeah. I I don't own a I don't own a plastic gun. <laughs> you know, I never oh my had. goodness! Okay, uh, um, I, I probably never will. Uh, <laughs> either talking about uh, you know a piece of metal that has weight and heft to it that I love. Yeah. Um, outside of the 1911, of course, you know, cabots are you know what I what I have and own and what I love. Uh, I don't own a 1911 outside of cabot. So, okay. You know, uh, part of what we do is you know we we want to live in our own bubble of looking at the 1911 mm -hmm. and so do that you know and we're not located where the rest of the industry is like you have to kind of isolate yourself and that's a little and that's kind of deliberate of uh, what we do uh but other than that you know uh, if it's not a if it's not the 1911 i do love nice shotguns so you know i have a few shotguns uh uh my favorite is probably this beautiful restored parker brothers that i own uh, but you know, I got uh, uh, you know a uh, Beretta, um, what a Silver Pigeon two or three or something like that. That you know, is terrific for doing doing you know sporting clays or okay. or trap. But okay. yeah, yeah, no, I mean, if if I had unlimited money, I'd be buying shotguns in addition to uh, maybe making more 1911s that I could personally keep in my own collection. Oh, okay, so you like <laughs> doing skeet shooting, uh, bird hunting? What kind of stuff is it that you you know? What are you using the shotguns for? Yeah, I mean, I, I've, I've never had the luxury to be a golfer, right? But when people mm -hmm. talk about golf, to me, it's the equivalent of, like, when I get to go shoot sporting clays at a nice facility, right? Mm -hmm. There's just a beautiful aspect of being out there, the rhythm to it. And there's some really fantastic courses that, to me, is like, okay, a beautiful day to spend the day. So I, I think, you know, I find that to be, you know, quite a bit of fun. I wish I could do more of it. Okay. You ever think about making, you know, a Cabot gun shotgun? No, no. I mean, it, we want to do we, we do one thing, and it's hard okay. enough to do one thing really, really well. And so uh, our commitment to focus is uh, dedicated to you know the 1911, and we do have some fun innovation coming out, and we can talk about that a little later too. Uh, okay. But that, you know, an evolution of the 1911 platform. Okay, cool. I respect that. R2. I know you probably own lots of different kinds of guns. I've got uh, one XD that's in pieces, nine millimeter original. Okay. And I got an XDS that's never been shot. The end. Oh really? Okay. That's oh that's your whole gun collection right there. Yeah, that's what the end says. The end. Oh no, Cabot guns. Well, you know, I have one, but it's at work, and it never comes home, and it just kind of sits okay. there. You're so. like that mechanic that his car doesn't work. <laughs> I do have I do have some 1911s, but they're in pieces, so I don't count them. <laughs> yeah, you're that guy. You're that guy that everything, does, all your guns are in pieces. Every gun we've ever, you know, we produce, so. Oh, uh, okay. You know. Yeah. Uh, it's it. the Delta Elite I have in pieces. It's phenomenal. <laughs> <laughs> okay that's i listen I, I i could say easily that i don't understand that but i actually do you know there's there's people like that out there let me get let me get another question in here and if people do have questions let us know we'll try to get them in the tyvin show who's also not a fan of anything polymer so, uh, he wants us to ask you guys is there any limit to what kind of material that they will not make a weapon out of um he says he'd like to have a 357 style 1911 made from Hastaloy? I don't know what that is. Yeah, I have no idea. Do you guys know what Hastaloy is? Or maybe a... 
have not worked with it. I mean, the, the yeah. limitation is the, the material has to be structurally suitable okay. to withstanding, you know, the load capacity of shooting a 45 ACP. Most of it makes them 45 ACP. Mm-hmm. So, you know, not all materials are suitable to uh, making a gun, you know, they, you know, they can't be too fragile. Um, and sometimes, you know, there's theory and then you have to test to find out what'll work. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, but if, if, if a material seems to be possible and, okay. uh, you know, uh, something's commissioned, I mean, there's probably nothing that we would not try. How about liberal tears? I want a 1911 made out of liberal tears. Can, uh, can we can we make this happen? You've made stuff from um, from pieces of the moon, asteroids. Or, you know, come on. Makes good lubrication, I'll tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, Len Holt says, "Have there been any requests for calibers other than forty-five or nine millimeter?" Yeah, a little bit. You know, we've done some some uh, ten millimeter, some thirty-eight super, uh, but you know, we we're pretty traditional. So I think we were probably the last producer to even make a nine millimeter. Resisted for a long time, but ultimately, you know, we got to listen to demand, and uh, you know, now it's you know nine millimeters, maybe thirty percent of our production. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I think um, I think uh, Tyvin was also texting me that I don't even know what Hestaloy is. Is that liberal tears? Somebody. It's a, it's a nickel chromium alloy thing. I just looked it up. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> I've never heard of it before. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We we have we have a we have a, a guy Jay who's like a metallurgy genius, and you know, you know, I mean, formerly from the aerospace industry, kind of retired, but you know, mm-hmm. uh, you throw any technical material question at him, and he's like Rain Man. It's freaking beautiful, like you know. Mm. Yeah, Tyvin is saying it's one of the hardest steels. So, there you, you go. guys, um, how much how much do you guys have to put into R and D for like when you're talking about like. These custom finishes, um, like the uh, so I was looking at one on the website. It's a blue, and I don't remember. I don't have it up. Um, it was a um, oh gosh, I can't think of what it was. But how much R and D do you guys have to put into like coming up with these finishes, like figuring out the best way to finish these? Yeah, it's a uh, it's a process of articulation, right, and iteration. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, for example, there's finishes that we've tried for years to develop. And just haven't quite gotten it. It, it didn't. It didn't work out right. <laughs> a little stubborn. Um, and then there are other finishes, for example, that you know uh, are accidents. And so one finish that's an accident that we had was uh, the vintage classic finish. You know, we we're trying to do one thing, didn't work out, so we took another path on it and uh, developed this finish we could not call our vintage classic finish. And you know. <laughs> that looks pretty. <laughs> when they first showed it to me, I was like, "Yeah, yeah, it's kind of I like kind of like it, but I don't I don't think it would be like a sellable gun because mm. most people who buy a cabot want something you know very, you know, flashy or polished or materials, and uh, so it's a thermal chemical um, uh, finish, uh, very durable, and you know it's it's our number one selling it finish by not it, by the actual it, the pistols uh, that we yeah. make. How it, do I find like that on old, the site? If you go under night drop the drop down for 1911 pistols, it's the fourth down called the Vintage Classic. Oh, Vintage Classic. It is like a classic World War II looking 1911. Like that is beautiful. Okay, yeah. I'm going to throw that up on the screen the, here. The so other one I was looking at that. was the Oh yeah. The, let's see what was it? The Mosaic Damascus. That's the one oh, I was looking at. How do you figure out to do stuff like that? Well, you know, the limitation from what we've done from a, like okay, so our our guns are really engineered pushing them pistols and, and the construction of the components um but so our limitation uh from a construction standpoint really is materials right or engraving or embellishment or finishing um when you're looking at that mosaic damascus there's our finishing on it but the pattern you see in that pistol is like that's in the steel itself so it's almost like a quilt every little square was hand forged and assembled, stacked, and uh, forged by hand uh, by a master blacksmith, and that's by a fellow named uh, Robert Eggerling. And uh, so, for example, I came across his material by accident, and you know, it, his work looks like nothing I've ever ever seen in the in the Damascus 
uh, uh, steel, uh, you know, sector from anyone. And, you know, his approach is, you know, I, like what you're looking at on that gun, that's his brain in steel. Every one of those little squares has a image, a pattern in it. And, um, uh, the complexity of it, I've been out to his shop and it's, you know, he works in a, a small shop in the woods in Eastern PA. Uh, it's like Willy Wonka style. He created his own equipment, how you move stuff. And he's, he's quite elderly now too. And this is like a master at his art doing the finest work he's ever done after a lifetime of dedication of doing something. And so, you know, in this case, uh, our job is to honor his material, you know, to machine it, cut it. And every type of steel that you cut, whether it's a type of steel or more importantly with, with Damascus steel, whether it be folded or mosaic, every steel has different cutting properties. So you have to learn there's an R&D process for every unique piece that you make. What is the speed of the cutter? What types of tooling? And uh, that's all done by trial and error. And it, and it can get extremely expensive extremely expensive to do that. Yeah, Richard Mondo, who's joining us from England, um, yeah. watching us over in England, he wants to know the price. I think there was one left on there, um, and it's like, what, 29000 30000 something yeah. in that range. Yeah, yeah. but yeah. hey, he's he's got uh, the pound, which is a little stronger, so yeah. his his money stretches a little further. Yeah, that's probably, <laughs> I don't know the rate of exchange. 24, in my 25? 20, he's, yeah, he's like 20, right. yeah, 20 something <laughs> thousand pounds. Not so bad, not so bad. It's a piece yeah. of art. <laughs> Now it's you know, well, the, this this one in particular is beautiful. Yeah, like, and and Richard that. Maunder in England, you could buy it, and uh, I'll take care of it over here for you in America. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So for for example, like you know, there's there's only four of those, right? And there's one block of steel he made enough to make you know four slides, four grips, and so it's something only four will ever exist, right? And um, uh, the material itself is spectacular. Of course, you know we had to learn how to finish it, to draw out the colors and the finishing. Um, and it's a gun, you know, that's competition grade in terms of like, you know, shooting ability. Uh, now, if I only had material to make one unit, that would have been a seventy-five to one hundred thousand dollar gun. Oh, okay. So, yeah. Because there's four, you know, then okay, there's it's still there's only four, but if there's one, then it'd be more valuable than four. But if there were twenty-five, you know, they, maybe they would be twenty thousand dollars. Yeah, I think Richard says he wasn't asking about that one. He was asking about the World World War Two style one, the uh, classic, seventy-five, the classic finish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's so there and and so for example, like you know, that vintage classic pistol, it's it's under four thousand yeah. dollars. Okay, which yeah. is that's still, that's pretty. pretty good. It's still a lot of money. It's a lot of money for me, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, but it's it's competitive with the other uh, upper end 1911s out there in terms of price. Mm -hmm. But fundamentally, from a construction standpoint, I mean, it's technically in a different class. Mm -hmm. So, from a, you know, a quality perspective, it's a lot of handgun for the money. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't think that's um, you know I I don't think that's terrible. I know there's people that obviously are not gonna. Everyone has their price point. Let's be honest about that whole thing. There's people who wouldn't spend that. But like you said, there's other there's things in life that people spend that kind of money on. Watches, you know, things of that nature, cars, whatever it is people spend their money on. So um, I, I could see that happening. And and Richard, that's a lot more affordable. You can buy you could buy two. You know, you can buy four. <laughs> well no, there's only one left. Oh, of the, no, of the of classic. The, yeah. Classic, yeah. Yeah, the vintage classic. So you know, you can probably buy four. I'll, I'll take two off your hands. Yeah, and, yeah. and speaking of, of two guns, uh, the one thing that we do that's unique in the marketplace is uh, we make a left-handed 1911. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, it's great if you're a left-handed shooter uh, because everything is inverted on the pistol, not just the ejection port, all the small controls. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, shooting a left and right-hand pistol is just fun. <laughs> it's just totally fun. Yeah. You know, you're talk uh, are you talking about dual wielding? Yo. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's that's my favorite yeah, thing. You know, these things go in the right direction. Yeah, uh, and you know, so so for example, but with collectors, like two guns have always been more valuable than one gun, and usually mm -hmm. they're consecutively numbered or something like that. But in our case, you know, because we can make everything, you know, the shit we don't. Okay, great, let's let's make it inverted. So um, you know, we can make a left and right-handed pistol set. And so for people that okay, what is very very unique out there? Uh, that's something that, you know, 
quite a few collectors and high-end enthusiasts uh, uh, have really appreciated, uh, you know, our, our production of that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm looking over at the American Joe Midnight Edition, which for anybody out there that's not on their website, it has a diamond for the front site. And I just thought of something. Have you guys ever considered putting like a tritium vial behind the diamond so the diamond like glows in the dark? Because that'd be amazing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, who takes who takes that question? Take a yeah, like a green tritium vial cool so in the dark time. You, you mentioned you want to work in the industry. Those are the type of creative ideas I like. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We have not, but I like it. You know, and you know, a, a diamond might seem over the top. I mean, it is over the top, but it's very functional. Like, I mean, it picks up light amazingly, as you would expect it to. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it's a luxury, but I mean, it, it's really... What carat like diamond are we talking about in that thing? <laughs> I mean, that's a perfect engagement for the man, you know? That's right, Marley. Yeah. You can find you one of these. Yeah. Don't give that to Lola or you'll get in trouble. Not that I mean, that size diamond, it's not that big enough to be impressive. Oh, 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 okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> but there's, yeah. you know, but there's a lot of workmanship into, you know, you know, crafting a diamond into a front sight, obviously. Mm-hmm. And, so there's more work than cost of diamond for something like that. Yeah, yeah. That's what I like about what you guys build. So now here's a question for me while I'm waiting for some other couple of questions to come in here before we go on to some other stuff. Um, what does someone have to do so that they can get under the glass and actually like be able to, you know, I want when when you have the next like I don't know where you're going for in the next one, ten million dollar, whatever. I remember when you had the meteorite guns. And no mm-hmm. one, I think William Bethards was the only dude other than you yeah. that could even Holy touch it. Holy, I'm yeah. looking at the price on those right now. Holy yeah. moly. Those well, sold, those sold, right? I know those. Well, see, okay. Hank, bear, bear in mind, though, like, uh-huh. uh, at any show that you see us at, right, we'll always have guns that can be handled, right? But if we have very expensive uh, <laughs> guns where, you know, I mean, somebody doesn't want their gun handled, you know, <laughs> I can't pass around. I'll be gentle. Dollars. I'll be gentle, though. I'll be gentle. Oh, man. If I were buying a four and a half million dollar gun, I'd be like, no, I don't want anybody. Yeah, to nobody that. touches it. Don't need <laughs> no, to breathe mine. on it. So somebody, yeah. you know, who, who we're, we we built or will sell a very high end pistol to, you know, we can't just like let everybody, you know, play with it because, I mean, it's just not correct. You know, I, I wouldn't want something that had been handled. handled. And, if they, and if we do, then. You know, I kind of have to keep it, and like I like keeping guns, but uh, you know, we're in business, and I need to sell guns too. But there's always a gun that you can feel. So, for example, we did just did the uh, U.S. Concealed Carry Show. Uh, it was here in Pittsburgh recently, and you know, with a wide range of guns you could handle. But I also brought a frame and slide, and which was very informative because I would just hand okay, he a racket gun like I'm like, wow, and that's typically the the reaction yeah, I get. It's like glass. Yeah. And then like, okay, now feel it without the springs in it. And then they like they move the frame and slide like it's like everything that, that you kind of kind of describe technically intolerance is everyone's like okay wow mm-hmm. that feels on roller bearing it's like it's on glass and then like okay I understand what I'm getting yeah and, and uh, it's it's a great tool and uh, it just made me think I'm I'm I'm, I'm always going to bring one to other shows going forward because it's it's a really great way to see firsthand you know how something feels yeah and that flows through to like the handling of the weapon and we played with every aspect of the 1911 so it's not just it was fit but it's like you know what's the balance how does it feel in the hand uh you know we even tinkered with how a gun would sound when you rack it Mm. so (laughs) why not yeah no totally the perception and I mean the pleasure of you know going to the range and shooting and handling a gun why should it be limited to I want you you to know you're about to get shot by the best (laughs) <laughs> you know i want you to know that this is coming you know but I, I you know what i agree i think that there's lots of things that people will say oh i would never um like i always thought oh i never buy a rolls royce or something like that and uh and then someone lent me made the mistake of lending me their rolls royce uh wraith one time i think they lent it to me for like a couple of hours and and, and i had to go to mcdonald's with him yeah yeah um i don't think they knew i was going to go to mcdonald's this is probably why you don't let me handle the guns, <laughs> you know, but when you actually, if you actually put, put your hands on something, then you go, oh, okay, I understand this now. <laughs> There's a difference. I'm for you on that ride, Hank. Huh? To McDonald's with the Rolls Royce. Yeah. 
many French fries did you accidentally drop down between oh, God. the console that you couldn't <laughs> it was, reach? Um, it was worse than that, actually. So uh, people here on this podcast told me they about McDonald's has a secret menu. I don't know if you've ever heard of secret menus. Yes. So no. appa- Yeah, so McDonald's has a secret menu, and there's something on there, I kid you not, called the McGangbang. So, it's a, a chicken sandwich and a burger combined, I think, right? Yeah. And something a fish fillet? Like, yes. Uh, it's some kind of weird combination of sandwiches. Yeah. So, But not all McDonald's do it, and you have to go to a McDonald's and ask for it. So I drove to a McDonald's, and I told the young lady that came to the thing, I want to make gangbang. And then she cursed me out. And I was like, no, this is a sandwich. You're supposed to have it. So then the like supervisor had to come over. It became a whole thing, but no, they wouldn't. They would not give me the McGang. But I had to order the sandwiches separately and make my own. Make it. Yeah, make in my a own very one. expensive car. Yeah, yeah, but you know, I make YouTube videos, so. Oh, you, you do. You yeah. get a big gang bang. Yeah, okay. yeah. Um, hey, but that, how you drop a knowledge? I, I'm, I'm going to test that. Huh? Oh, that sounds great. It, it depends on – so for, from what I've heard, it depends on the person working behind the register. Some know, some don't. <laughs> yeah. It's just like – doesn't Whataburger do that too? I think – They have some weird stuff Yeah, too. I think all these yeah. fast, food, fast food places have a weird – you know, you guys might want to try that as an idea, Cabot Guns, you know, like have a secret menu gun. Somebody calls up and says, I want the liberal tears. And that this is what you get. Yeah. <laughs> you do. In fact, you know, I mean we have what's on the website. But then we have – we do, there's a lot of unique work we do that never gets to the website, just doesn't get seen. I mean, you mm-hmm. know, and sometimes it's commissioned work. Sometimes, okay, we're just trying to do something different, right? Mm-hmm. And then, okay, it's, you know, it's, it's, so there there is an off menu, and uh, uh, and that gets popular. I get a lot of people saying, what do you have, right? It's like I'll send them a cell phone picture. Oh, cool, I'll take it. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> so – yeah, we don't call it our McGangbang. But yeah, you <laughs> might, you know, start. It puts the one-off, you know, yeah. uh, drawer occasionally that'll have something in it. Um, yeah, for sure. Um, what do you guys? How do you guys handle? Well, two two part question here: warranty stuff, and do you guys have people that run the guns pretty hard that you have to send it back every now and then? Like, how does that work? Yeah, I mean, first of all, you know, if you're going to make a very high end product, you have to stand behind the product, right? Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, we aspire for perfection. There's no such thing as perfection, but we do truly aspire to um, go as near as perfection as possible. So, you know, anytime, you know, somebody buys a gun from us, you know, you, you get you get the type of support you would expect, any help. And you know, I've had people that the first gun they bought is a Cabot. So, you know, somebody who comes into the industry and like, Okay, I'm buying my first gun. I want to buy a very good gun, right? And they end up buying a Cabot. And so from that point, like you're even, you know, you're walking through fundamentals. Like, okay, you know, your four rules of safety. <laughs> you're just making mm-hmm. sure, you know, because we have with our rights become come a lot of responsibilities. So whether it's somebody newer to the industry, where you, you know you want to make sure they're buying a gun safely, they know their safety rules, and you know you're helping them out or guiding them towards some training. Uh, to somebody, you know, very sophisticated, you know, we sponsor a shooting team who compete at the highest levels. Uh, you know, anyone who buys a Cabot gun, you know, you're buying the gun, but you're also buying, you know, the reliability of like, we're there. And, you know, if there's ever a need, I mean, we're on it instantly. Mm-hmm. Uh, anybody who's owned a Cabot who's needed anything will tell you. Uh, you know, we, we believe our, our service is really second to none. And, and it's, it's that way because we, we, we care, (laughs) we, we care fundamentally, you know, every item that goes out has our name on it. It has our passion. It has our hard work and, uh, there's no compromise. Even if it's a customer, even if the customer does something wrong, which, you know, has happened many, many times, you know, we, we've done stuff because it's the right thing to do. And, um, uh, so, you know, our, our, our support experience is, is, I believe, as high as it can be. It's commensurate with any quality product that, that, you, that you would buy and that you would expect because obviously cause you don't always get that today. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so there was a customer that tried to use it as a hammer? Uh. <laughs> well, you know, I had somebody send me a video a few months back um, and well, R2 forwarded it to me. And I didn't know what the video was. And so I'm looking at the video and like, 
the guy, you know, it's winter out, and he has a large Tupperware container, of, you know, with frozen dirt in it. Okay. And he peels it open, and he has a hammer and a hack, you know, a little, and starts chipping away at, at the dirt. Okay, nice. No, 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 no. I know it's not going. And he's chipping away. See, like, holy cow! There, there's a gun in there, right? Uh huh. And then he gets close. I'm looking at it. Wow, it's one of our guns. Okay. And it, I mean, it happened to be a vintage classic that we're talking about. And now look at it. It's a left-handed vintage classic. And uh, he had a plug in the front of it, and it had been loaded. And, you know, just chipped away at all of it and took it out and shot it. I mean, I'm like, wow. We've had some very extreme testing. Mm-hmm. Is that um, on YouTube? Because I want to see that. I don't know. I don't yeah. know. I, R2, I is that, that on YouTube? Did you get that from YouTube or the customer? <laughs> Yeah, I think it is on YouTube. I think he actually posted it. He shot three different guns in the video and uh, just checked them out to see how they'd fare through a test like that. Oh, respect. Yeah, it, it ran, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I respect it. Yeah. I don't know if I would necessarily do that. Uh, I, yeah. I have a $600 Colt, and I, I wouldn't do that to this gun. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, these were all... These were all high dollar guns. I mean, he probably had four to five thousand dollars worth of custom work in one of the guns. Just a base gun with custom work done mm. to it. Mm. Okay. And did so did all the guns that did, do you remember did all the guns run? Do you remember who this was? Well that gets stretched. Yeah, I'd have to do some digging. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I respect this guy, man. That's a yeah. real gun guy right there. But buy the Cabot guns, man. I was gonna say. By the way, what comes one of your guns that I think comes close to perfect for me is that monolithic, uh, like stainless steel. The mat. Uh, what was it? The icon. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Hank. It's uh, yeah. it's my personal favorite. Oh, I love that thing. That's that's uh, pretty close to perfection. Really clean. You know, yeah. it's it's minimalism, right? To me, it's uh, you know, if an architect was gonna look at a gun, you know, in a very modern sense. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know that clean monolithic look the simplicity yeah. it's like you know when you when you strip away all that's necessary you know sometimes you have something left that's very beautiful mm-hmm. and you know, the lines of 1911 themselves are, are are you know have been elegant for over 100 years um and the gun being all stainless all from a block of steel uh it just works but you know we we tinkered with every small detail which may not be obvious too so, for example, rather than cocking serrations, we wanted something that would look unique. So we developed what's really a cocking button. But the diameter of that button, the placement of that button, as by way of one small example, something we tinkered around for a long time to get just perfect. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, that gun to me is both, uh, I mean, it's a tool, right? But mm-hmm. it's also a bit gun so to me you know it's, I, I feel like you get a little bit of both in it yeah it says me man that's me all day just classy oh, and simplified you. and elegant you know that's I don't, says me. I don't know in my brain in my brain i know all yeah, of you guys are thinking say. yeah I just don't understand what you're talking about but in my mind that's who that's me when i see that i go okay yeah that's how i would roll and then i think you had um i think it was a couple of years ago you had like a i think you had a matt's black gun didn't you it was like matte with a, like a black finish no uh you, you know there's there's a I, yeah we, i thought there was yeah, something that's a whole is. range of guns actually. yeah there's a i know there's a lot of them there's a there's there's a lot coming out okay let's see what do we want to get to here you guys you guys were first of all you're in pennsylvania i don't know if we covered that you've always been in pennsylvania right oh hold on a second there it goes there it goes baby face that's my future gun right there. That's my future gun. So what's gun. the what's the, the cocking button on the side? What is that? Yeah, hold on. Let me. Is put that, this. That's just me... to. Yeah, that's to help to give oh. you purchase and racking the gun. Oh, cool. Interesting. Yeah. yeah, just hold that up a little bit, Rob. Uh, up higher. Yeah, there we go. Look at that thing. <laughs> Hank likes that. That's thing. just sexiness. That is sexy right there. I would have Lola uh, call up the divorce lawyer because I ordered that. And didn't consult with her like I'm supposed to before I spend more than 20 bucks. <laughs> I would run that risk. <laughs> and, yeah, then, you know, and then just have to make up for it later. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's stainless steel from head to toe. I mean, the sights, everything. Um, but, you know, like all, all our other guns, like when you rack it and you feel, 
the way the gun feels. This is like wow. I mean, it's like these things. Like when you drive a car, a good car, it's kind of hard to go back. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Yeah. No, it's it's, it's my know. personal favorite of yeah. our models. I agree with that too. That's very difficult. You know, once you once you experience uh, awesomeness. <laughs> You're like no, I don't think so. I'm not. I'm not going backwards. Dude, yeah. Brian Quick. Brian Quick had a good question. Uh, okay. Does Cabot Guns come and take your gun back if you're caught carrying it in a Kydex holster? <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> yeah. Seriously, you need you need like good alligator or some very good leather, something like that. You should be getting an Andrew's custom leather holster, by the way. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. No. And then we we work with uh, Sam Andrews quite a bit. Yeah. Uh, really exclusively on anything nice. Yeah. Uh, and by, you know, so for example, uh, you know, the way we care is all personal, right? What's comfortable for you. And, but I've always liked shoulder rigs. You know, quite often I wear, I wear sports coats and like a shoulder rig to me is just a comfortable way that I find uh, to carry. And I used to have like a, uh, like the Galco, uh, what do you call it? Vice, Miami Vice, uh, whole, mm-hmm. you know, rig or something. And, you know, it was fine, right? Tied down, right? But it kind of always flapped around. And how I met Sam was I, I was at an NRA convention just walking around and I saw this beautiful, you know, uh, uh, gun leather and he had a, he had an exotic rig there and go ahead, can I try it on? And when I tried it on, I couldn't believe it. You know, like his, his, his shoulder rigs just, they hug the body. Mm-hmm. There's no tie down. You bend over, like they, they, they just stay beautifully flat mm-hmm. and, just look at Sam, how do you do it? And he goes, it's just trial and error over 30 years of, of cutting patterns. And so... Like you said, that's what he does. He bakes holsters, man. <laughs> you know, To the craftsmanship, <laughs> the beautiful exotic leathers he works yeah. with. And on top of that, you know, you know, we, we buy products, but, you know, it's the people. It really is. And, mm-hmm. you know, and on top of that, and Sam has, you know, you know Sam. He's, he's a gentleman. He's one of the finest uh, folks you'll meet out there, too. Yeah. So... But it's quite important. Yeah, I think that's one of the things about Sam Andrews that people are happy to like call up, talk to him, and order something. I always tell people you're buying the person more than the thing. Obviously, the thing is what you hold on to, but you value it more because of the people that that make it. That's why I always try to get guys like you guys to come on so that people can see what actually. You know, we were talking about this before we started the show. It's, it's not easy in a five, ten, fifteen minute video to explain to people why they shouldn't just go buy a Rock Island Armory 1911, which I don't think, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. Go do that if that's what you can do. But why why would you invest in something like this? Um, you know, what's the difference? Is there like a real tangible difference between that and this? I, To me personally, I feel like having a connection with the person who made something is just always a little more special than just buying something off the shelf. That's how I am. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, even if you got to put it now, I, I know I've asked you this before, Rob. So, um, you know, I, I think you're not going to be offended, but can people put these on layaway? <laughs> uh, well, <laughs> I mean, I don't, I don't have a layaway, you know, program. <laughs> uh, but you know, I mean, I, 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 listen, uh, the most meaningful gun builds um, that uh, that we do is really like. Somebody who comes and it's a it's a real sacrifice and reach mm-hmm. to spend thousand dollars on a gun, and and you know and to me this is an, an enormous obligation to deliver something where like I know the expectations are going to be very high, but I know it's like an important object that they're going to have for their life. They're going to value, uh, and but you know it, like I said it, you know I, I acknowledge it. I mean it's a lot of money. Uh, so we've had people that okay great you know I, I want to buy a gun and I want to pay for it over a year year and a half whatever it is and it's better you know if we don't have to rush a bill this is terrific so I mean I've had people that you know every month they'll spend they'll send in them some money mm-hmm. and sacrifice along the way and I'll tell you when you know people are making that sacrifice it's extremely meaningful you know I, I've had clients that are billionaires and uh you know, really interesting folks too, but you know they can buy a very expensive gun like you and I go buy some Tic Tacs. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, no, I mean at the, at the level somebody who's making the uh, sacrifice for the everyday guy, you know, mm-hmm. it's an awesome responsibility to 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 you know deliver something that we know is is such a meaningful object. Mm-hmm. You could have you could have ten five hundred dollar guns, 
there's lots of people out there that that have that, you know. And then there's, I think, one, depending on the amount of time you've been doing this and how you evolve, there's someone who realizes, look, I understand what this thing is. I will save for a year or two years, put this money aside and get this. Because if I'm going to get a 1911, I'm going to get this. If I'm going to get an AK-47, I'm going to get this. Oh, okay. Babyface is showing off his uh... saving for talk about saving for a year. Yeah, I wanted I wanted a Python. I got a Python. Yeah, nice. and I didn't I didn't want to settle for something other because I wanted a Python. Yeah. So, but it was the same thing. I had to I had to buck up and put some money away so I could afford this. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's you know if if um, if you really if you realize what you're getting, it's really not that much of a sacrifice to do it. People do it for a lot of things. I see someone was here asking if I would give up my car. Um, no, why why do I got get, got to give up the car, man? You can have you can have it all. You can have it all. If you could give up your one car at a time. to get a, a Cabot. Um, I don't know. I would take the Cabot. <laughs> uh, no, I'm gonna I'm gonna have both. That's what I believe in. You can have you can have it all. Maybe not all at the same time. You take, you know, take care of this, pay that off, then you do this thing. That's how it goes. <laughs> Lola, yeah. Lola will never be a rich woman because of you. Yeah. Well, she, <laughs> you know, when she got married, <laughs> you know, my mom tried to warn her. I remember, I, I was there. <laughs> yeah. <you know? laughs> and my mother was like, you should, "Do you really know what you're getting into here?" <laughs> so um, let's see. Let's go to some. Let's go to some, if there's any more questions. Or actually, you you were talking about uh, stuff that you guys are coming up with. So if either one of you or, you know, we can we can get uh, R2 in here, what's coming up with the future of Cabot Guns? Can we get some exclusives from you guys? Can we, can you break some news? I'm, I'm sworn to secrecy, honestly. <laughs> I'm waiting for, I'm waiting to read Rob's poker face up there. <laughs> <laughs> the total. Yeah, and, and I'll, I'll fill in the picture. The, uh, uh, you know, and uh, Rob Schaland, was a consultant to me for many years before he came to work mm -hmm. in house for, for Cabot. Right. And, you know, so obviously, you know, we, we valued his talent and acumen, you know, at a very high level. Cause there's one thing from making the component to, you know, to ten thousandths of an inch in accuracy to understanding how everything interfaces and work, you know, so there's, there's a number of arts. Mm -hmm. um, but Rob had a, a company called Alchemy Custom Weaponry. And uh, it was something, you know, custom gun maker, have, have a gun made by, you know, the, the, the top tier gunsmith. Uh, um, and so to bring Rob in house, we bought his company. Mm. It's how much, how much I valued him as, a, as an individual talent. And um, so he moved, you know, he, you know, moved, you know, uh, came to work for us full time. And, and last year we... Uh, you know, it occurred to us, you know, you know, we when we bought uh, Rob's company and we didn't buy it for the business, we bought it for we wanted Rob. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. he, he had an existing brand with the core clientele uh, that were highly knowledgeable 1911 enthusiasts. And so, you know, people have always asked me, why can't you make a gun that's more affordable? And, you know, as I was trying to explain, the process of how we build a gun in every component of the cabinet is a very costly process itself. So we thought, well, you know, we have uh, the Alchemy Custom Weaponry brand. Um, it had been around before. And so um, I asked Rob Shalin to uh, design uh, three guns the way a, pist a, cu a traditional custom pistol smith would build a gun. And it's a different philosophy. It's a different build process. But it, it has allowed us to bring a new brand of 1911s to the market called Alchemy Custom Weaponry, which we rebirthed. And um, they're a true pistol smith made 1911, you know, high fit and finish. Uh, but they're also quite a bit more affordable than the uh, Cabot's, you know, still not mass market, but, you know, at, at $2,500. Mm, okay. uh, I would suggest it's the highest quality 1911 on the market. And so it's a different process. So somebody's saying, well, why can't, you know, look at somebody else and why can't you build that? Well, no, we can't. And if we're going to do it, we're going to do that better than anybody else at $2,500. So quietly, we brought that to market over the last year. And there's, you know, three general base models that, you know, Rob designed. Where can we the see brand. these? Are these on the website? Let me see. If uh, they're not. It's a separate oh. brand. Oh, okay. It's, it's called uh, uh, alchemy1911.com. Okay. okay. It's the website. Mm -hmm. And 
uh, you'll see that styling wise, it's uh, it's very traditional 1911s. It's the purest guns, and it's all it's all Rob Rob Shawlin's philosophy and design. Rob, do you want to talk about a little bit about uh, you know your own personal love and design and view of what the 1911 should be? Stylistically, um, I always enjoyed. Particularly, uh, Novaks used to do custom work on Colts. A lot of people would send their 70 series Colt to Novak and it'd come back and everything was just straightened out. It was nice and clean looking. Everything you needed, nothing you didn't. You know what I mean? Just a, a vintage looking gun. Um, so I wanted to hang with the original 1911 style frame, not the A1 style frame, uh, like you would see on the 1918 reissue Colt. So there's no scallops on the frame, giving it a very early 1911 look. Um, and depending on where you're looking on the website, because there's varying levels, there's prototype guns, which were built with what parts we could possibly, you know, source at the time to build a prototype gun. Then there's actual current production guns. Like if you go to the Prime Elite page, that is a current production gun. And you'll see kind of all the features that, that are rolled into those guns. Okay, um, yeah, we're, I'm throwing up the uh, website. is scrolling on there right now. You say go check out uh, Prime Elite. Go what ahead. brown holster is that on the Prime Elite? Because that thing looks awesome. Do you know in the pictures? I can link it if you guys oh, want. Oh, that no, that's got to be um, that has to is that be a Sam. Is that a Andrew's custom? Has to be right. Or I don't oh, know. Let me pull it. Let yeah, me pull it up. Know. There's there's a link. Yeah. Um, it's a beautiful dark brown. That's just it. Like hit me as like that is a style and type of holster that I love. I want to say that's like elephant or um, pretty or something. Um, yeah, that looks like it could very well be uh, Andrew's custom. This, so <laughs> this is, I think that for me personally, the thirty five hundred is almost a little out of my price range. Twenty five, I could get myself to spend twenty five on a very high end nineteen eleven. Like, to me, I would consider that a high end nineteen eleven. Mm -hmm. And these are beautiful guns. Yeah. Oh so, yeah, and this is you know, um, uh, and you know, so I mean, this is a lifetime of dedication to the nineteen eleven from Rob's end. And so, for example, uh, there's unobvious details that are important. So you know, if you think of a custom pistol smith, Rob for you know couple decades has been altering you know frames for fit and feel and ergonomics right and so you know our background with with cabot we said hey rob you can design your own frame right and this is something you know a pistol smith wouldn't have the ability to do and so rob designed the gun so for example the ergonomics when you put that in the hand is absolutely remarkable and it's a function of the high grip cut the, the, the contours for it and so, you know, we did, it was designed from the ground up, frame and slide. Uh, but unlike, you know, Cabot, you know, I mean, there are prints, our designs, right? And we have them machined here in the U.S., but simply to industry standards that are different than, than Cabot standards. And then, you know, Rob gunsmiths them and fits them together. Uh, uh, him and one other fellow, uh, 25 and 30 years experience, uh, you know, uh, doing fit and finish at a very traditional level. And so it's 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 certainly an homage to a, you know, we, we've departed. I mean, Cab is probably the most extreme example of departure from tradition, but this is a real throwback to the classic 1911, classic cues, you know, in a retro gun, but you know, from you know, with modern components. Yeah, yeah. That was it. That was my whole my whole inspiration for the guns was the the tendency with the high-end 1911 market and even some of the middle range guns is to go more and more tactical with mm -hmm. the look of 1911. Mm -hmm. uh, lots of angles and bevels on slides and holes in slides, you know? Yeah, which is and, not really why you're going 1911, right? Sorry, go ahead. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So I thought, you know, why not just go 180 degrees from where the industry's going and just see what happens because that's what I love. Mm -hmm. Man, yeah, these are beautiful. This is this is more especially when we're talking higher in 1911s. This is more of my taste than the uber tactical. Like I love a classic looking gun. Mm -hmm. That's what yeah, you I'm, Go ahead. Yeah, I want, what you're looking at there is like it's 100% Rob's personality. So, I mean, this is fundamentally and like there like you know, and, and when we started, you know, we asked Rob 
design three models with like as you want them. Right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> it wasn't mm-hmm. okay. Here's kind of the goal. There. It's like, no, design three pistols that in your mind represent the 1911 as you love it. Right. Yeah. Not as no, you weren't thinking price point or production cost yeah, point or anything. Based on your personal style and, you know, as 30 years specializing in one thing. Uh, and so, I mean, this certainly um, uh, completely represents, uh, you know, Rob's personality, his view and, and you know, what he loves in a pistol. And, and that's what we kind of wanted to bring out, you know, and the wonderful craftsmanship that, um, you know, he, he's brought to market within the 1911 sector. Yeah, yeah these are beautiful guns. Yeah. What should... just, I'm comparing it to the Colt that I have in my hand, and you can see so <laughs> many differences, just like elegant differences to these 1911s here. Yeah. So, so uh, you know, R2, when, let's say someone goes into a gun store, picks up a gun or your gun show, however you're coming across these 1911s, if you, if you pick it up, what would you uh, be looking for? And Because and, I'd like to get that from you and then get it from, uh, from Robert Bianchi as well. But, you know, let's start with you. Well, for me, first thing I do is, you know, I I open the gun, check a chamber, and, and just I start checking how things are fit within the gun. And, you know, how, how are parts fit? How do they feel when you manipulate the parts? Um, and then I, you know, start, start looking at the finish a little bit. What's the quality level of the finish? You know, um, see if I can spot any identifiable, you know, flaws in the finish or an area where somebody said... You know, eh, nobody will notice that kind of a thing. You know, so it kind of tells me if you can see that on the outside of a gun, it tells me that maybe something inside the gun got looked at and said, eh, you know, they'll never see that. They'll never take the gun apart or, Mm -hmm. you know, and there's a lot of that that goes on. The the whole let the repair department handle it kind of thing. So you look for those obvious, you know, kinds of things and fit of the parts mainly for me personally. Okay. All right. How should that slide, you know, Robert was talking about the slide. How should that slide feel from your point of view when you pull? Or do you even, do you, do you think about that? I'm, I'm, I'm assuming you do. There you go. There oh boy. It is. Oh boy. <laughs> yeah. Do that again, baby. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so is this a good thing or a bad thing? <laughs> This is uh, an old. This is an old Series seventy that has shot a lot of rounds, and it still works fine. And that's all I care about. <laughs> you know, there are yeah. some guys out there that will tell you that these tight guns that we make these days, they're just not reliable. What if you get some sand in it? I'd rather have that gun right there if I get some sand in it. You know, you hear it all the time. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, yeah. that's a that's a debate for for another hour. You know. Yeah, right. the opposite point of view. If you got a tight gun, sand doesn't get in it. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's what I say. That was uh, what was that? Uh, oh, Ian from uh, Forgotten Weapons did a test. Well, recently, within the last couple months, AK versus AR-15. AR-15s are tighter, AKs are looser, and they found that because AR-15s are tighter, that when they went to dunk it in mud and whatnot, there was less ingress of junk into it versus the AK that got fouled up. AK was easier to clean out because you could just, you know, slosh in some water. But there is something to be said about having nice tolerances where debris can't actually get into your gun. Yeah. And it also depends on whether it's going in or out, right? <laughs> so, I mean, it, it could get, if it's easy to get in there, but easy to get out, not so bad. Yeah. If it's if, difficult if it's... to get in there, it might run longer until something gets in there and then, mm-hmm. you know, then it can't find its way out. So, um, but yeah. Uh, I need to. I, I would love to feel having owned a Wiggle Beast like this. I would love to feel what a true like tight 1911 feels like because I've never really experienced that. Oh well. Cool. Yeah, and there's there's tight, but there it, but there it has to be tight and smooth. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Exactly. And so you know if you think of like the contact points and the rails which which a frame and slide fit on, if you can build components where the tolerances are high and the mating surfaces are flat and parallel, right? Then they glide together. Typically, if you got a tight gun, that's simply you know force fit together. If you look at the where the frame and slide, for example, meet, you have little highs and low contact points, especially under magnification. And so the gun is really riding on those contact points back and forth. And so as you shoot a gun, 
it wears on the contact points. And if you have contact points, then the fit changes over time and performance yep. changes over time. Mm. So, mm. Uh, you know, there's uh, incidental benefits to, uh, you know, building to a high tolerance. And you, you, can't, you can't do that tolerance by hand. Now, a, a big misconception is you think, you know, somebody, you stick a piece of steel in the machine, you, you push a button. That is not true. You know, the finesse of the operator working in the machine when you're working in high tolerances, I mean, the ears become very important tools. You know, the speed of the tool, the angle that it goes in, the type of tool, the human involvement in making very high precision components is astounding. I mean, people don't realize it. You know, there's no human involvement in making low tolerance components, right? That's why they're cheap, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, it's the opposite. I mean, the amount of time and hours to make really high quality components is, uh, uh, you know, most people would not appreciate how much is involved to make, you know, a simple object, especially making it here in America, you know, with highly skilled people. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's your secret to the, to the, to that feel of the slide? 100%. Yeah. Okay. So, so it's, it's the, it's the tolerance in which we build all the components and therefore how they interface together. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you can't do that through a different me methodology. And so that construction is absolutely unique. Nobody builds a gun the way we build a gun in the industry. It's a different process. Mm -hmm. So it was counterintuitive at the beginning. People think, well, if the guy's not, you know, altering and fixing all the component, why is it more expensive? And it's like because to make a component properly, you know, is a multiple more than a, a, you know, in, from working from a poorly made component and then altering it to make it work. So then yeah. you also get a box of chocolates. Like who made it, what day, what component, mm -hmm. all the material variability. So uh, yeah, it's, it's two fundamentally different things, you know. And in that in that regard, you know, we we brought you know a new way of doing things. Now, finishing is a different um, uh, aspect because even after a component is properly made, there's still you know hand finishing to you know remove tooling marks to polish etc and so there's still a huge amount of human involvement in you know in, 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 in all processes from you know making every component to the finishing to you know treatments to acid etching to polishing you know mm -hmm. that's they're all you know highly skilled and high, highly human um, uh, uh, aspects of, of construction so how does that affect uh, maintenance R2 like uh do we? Do you have to do less maintenance with uh, the level of 1911s you guys are building? Uh, is it more? Is it, you know? You know, I th I think about this quite a bit. Um, there's quite a difference between what people would call an interference fit, where a lot of times if somebody file fits something together, let's say they file fit uh, a frame and slide together. Mm -hmm. If they're wanting to keep a tight fit, they're going to stop short of it being, you know, 100% because they don't want to go too far and get it loose. Um, so then you're out there shooting a gun that has an interference fit or a hard fit, you know, which has its place in bullseye competition, I can tell you that. But for the most part, for the production guns, if somebody's force fitting a gun together, then that puts you in a situation where you can break more parts, so to speak. A couple of parts are more susceptible to breakage than others, but, you know, I find that your standard maintenance intervals, like uh, a spring changes, stuff like that, are pretty much congruent with, with any type of pistol. Okay. You know? Yeah, Hank, what I, what I can tell you is that a, a gun built the way we, we build it will outlast a typically made 1911. You know, whether it's production or custom hand fit. And that's the virtue of like, you know, mating surfaces and how they interface together. It'd be the same analogy as, for example, of a, of the, as a progressive die that punches parts. The higher the tolerance is, the longer the, the economic life of it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we don't know how much more, and it's significant, it is than a typical 1911 because you need enough data to mm -hmm. make a meaningful comparison. Okay. But you know, by virtue of process, uh, uh, the longevity of, of a gun that we build is, is significant, significantly more than any other 1911. Okay. And that's some materials and then every component being made to high tolerances so that they interface well together. Okay. And then so far as maintenance, you guys have specific things you recommend like, uh, 
you know, for cleaning, lubrication? Um, is it just whatever that person usually uses? How does that work? Well, I mean, there's a lot of stuff that goes around about, let's start with lubrication. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's, there's duck fat, there's cooking oil. Yeah, motor oil. Frog lube. <laughs> yeah. I mean, did you guys buy frog lube? Uh, do, do not Thank use. Goodness. I did, as a, as a matter of testing things, worst thing to put into a gun. Okay. Yeah. I stick with, believe it or not, I stick with synthetic, full synthetic red line racing oil. Okay. To, on a 1911, an all steel gun. Hmm. And it probably worked well on a polymer gun too, as far as rail sliding parts. Mm -hmm. um, that's my big thing. Um, ignition components, um, and then if I'm if I'm final assembling a gun, I'll actually use some uh, some kind of a fast fire gun grease on contact points, meaning lower lugs of the barrel to slide stop interface, upper lugs of the barrel in the slide, anything that slams together that type of thing. I'm going to use a grease on that. Okay. Tight 1911s, the frame and slide will just plow your grease off your rails, and then you'll be left with nothing. So thin oil is best on a tight, high-end 1911. Okay, but no specific brands or anything you guys recommend? Uh, there's a lot of good stuff out there. Matter of fact, one of the most underestimated gun oils I think I've ever seen is M-Pro 7, okay. which is a TLP product, or even Break Free will surprise you. Okay, okay. All right, good stuff to know. Um, okay, David Cardinal, I'm just trying to get some uh, questions in here. He says, what are the, uh, you guys' thoughts on wire recoil springs in 1911? Any? Uh... Yeah, well, we, we uh, you mean a flat wire? Is that the question? Uh, he says, what are your thoughts on flat wire? Yes, flat wire yeah. recoil springs in well, 1911. Well, we, we use a, uh, a flat wire recoil spring in our commander size 1911s. Uh, you know, I mean, for one, the, the longevity of, of a flat wire spring uh, is longer than a, a, a typical one. But, you know, for us, uh, the reason why we use it is when we engineered a commander size 1911. You know, again, because we're doing it from scratch, we did we wanted to do it our way. And so uh, Browning, of course, made the government size 1911. And there is a magic in the timing of that gun, how it feels in the hand when you shoot it, when it cycles. And then later when Colt made a smaller gun, basically they shrank all the gun, including the internals. So it's a smaller gun, a shorter stroke, and so it feels different in the hand and in, in addition to being choppier, you know, the dimensional aspects of where the ejector extractor, all that changed, right? So mm -hmm. we went back, hang on, you know, can you fit Browning's original uh, cycle and recoil into the commander format? And that's exactly what we did. Okay. Well, we did that by altering a number of the components in the gun, including the slide, the uh, uh, not only the uh, the, uh, the uh, spring, only the rails, mm -hmm. but you have to create a busher that was shorting less. You know, you design a uh, barrel that had less meat in front of the front log, uh, and then you know, but to, for to cycle that length, you also needed a different uh, spring other than something traditional, and that's where a flat wire spring came into play in our commander. But at the end of the day, you know, with the amount, man, now you have a smaller 1911, whether you give up nothing in terms of like performance and feel of shooting the gun. So, I mean, we, we kind of backed into using that flat wire spring for that reason. But, you know, from um, all the data that's available, the longevity of a flat wire spring uh, far exceeds a, a traditional recoil spring. But, you know, I look at recoil springs as like, I mean, okay, you should change yours anyhow, <laughs> you know, every whatever rounds you think mm -hmm. is you know to be appropriate okay uh, and, and so uh it's one of those components that you know okay whether it's a regular spring or a flat wire you should still change this out whenever it's appropriate on, on a gun okay uh how do you guys develop these guns by the way are you doing some of this on the computer are you doing it like you know in actual guns you're building them testing them how does that work out yeah, no, so uh, everything needs to be prototyped, of course. Uh, internally, you know, we have everything from all the highest end solid works uh, for constructioning and designing of components, right? Mm -hmm. and, then it's, it, and then, you know, quite frankly, you know, some things are trial and error. So what exactly is the right fit on a gun for individual components that will either add, add, add you know, performance or not? 
right? And so what we've been able to do is, you know, scientifically develop data. And, you know, we've been able to do it because we're building a certain process. Okay, if you vary one item by tolerance X, what is the actual effect on performance? Mm-hmm. And so there is data that we could learn uh, and understand through, uh, you know, an, an, a, an adequate amount of data. Because you can't do it with one gun because that's anecdotal. And most people rely on very anecdotal experience to make judgments. So we were under, we, we, we've been able to understand, like, what are the right fits and tolerances to achieve optimal performance on a, on a pistol? And because we could only vary one component at a time and maintain everything the same, we, we've been able to um, understand the why of how the gun works in a very unique scientific uh, perspective. And this is where like, some of the engineering background uh, that Mike Heber, for example, has in the company, and then the same background as tool makers um, who can make components, you know, that'll vary from, you know, talking from, you know, hair splitting precision. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, you know, we didn't take any anecdotal approach because, you know, if you ask, ask a gun maker how to do something, you'll get a variability of approach. And a lot of it is like, you know, I don't want to call it woo-woo gunsmithing, but, but you know. Black you know, magic. Like, you know, people <laughs> who try one thing, yeah. that happens to work, so they assume that was a causal relationship. Well, mm-hmm. How do you know that? So we like asking the why. And so I think we delved into like, you know, the science of the 1911 in a way that's very, very unique. I can tell you right now, I mean, internally we've developed knowledge that I'm sure, you know, hasn't been, you know, tested al- elsewhere because simply it's the process of how we do it. And, you know, and then having said that, there's more than one way to do it. So I'm not saying it's the only way to do it. Uh, but w- w- what we know, we've kind of learned the hard way from, you know, testing and research and and then verification it's a very scientific approach it's both science and art that we've tried to bring to the table and gab it okay very cool let me ask you this i'm going to take some uh, crazy questions here uh let me ask you what do you guys think about double stacked what do you think double stacked r2 double stacked is that sacrilege baby face we don't we don't want to know what you think <laughs> Because <laughs> we already know, we already know. Yeah. You can chime in if you want to, Patrick. It's sacrilege. It's sacrilege. Okay, there you go. Sacrilege. Okay, what do you say, Robert? Yeah, it. Sacrilege. Double stack. No, nah, I'm quite open-minded. I mean, we haven't done one yet. Okay. Uh, but I, I could see, I could see us like dipping our toe and developing a double stack, maybe. But you know, it, you know, it, like you have, like, what's the purpose of a gun, right? You have to step back why you're buying a gun, you know, how you're engineering it, for what use. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, I think you'll see maybe next year something uh, very innovative from from us coming, um, you know, to the platform. And and we've kind of talked about it quietly Mm. uh, outside of this uh, conversation. The Hank Hank magazine is coming. So we uh, uh, we can share it here as well. Uh, one of the things that we've done is if we, we looked at what, you know, what are the weakest elements within the 1911 design as perfect as it is. Okay. And, uh, uh, we've prototyped and tested and now we're doing it through a series of, you know, 10 additional guns to, you know, perfect is, uh, we've changed the entire extraction system in 1911. Okay. And so up and now we've made the 1911 design more precisely than ever before. But this is the first time we've made a mechanical change, and uh, uh, we think it's a pretty big deal. Okay. We think it'll make the extraction in a 1911 as reliable as the extraction in the Glock. Okay. Now, a big statement. <laughs> it's a very, very big statement. Um, uh, so Let me see. How is that? You know, Can my brain so, comprehend what we're – how we that think gets from done. a mechanical standpoint, uh, it'll be a very nice uh, – uh, uh, improvement hmm. to the 1911 platform, okay. and you know you may see that within our product line uh, as early as uh, next year. Okay, and specifically there'll be a debut model that will have that. Uh, that'll also be unique in, in several aspects. Uh, so that's our first, you know, deviation in you know playing with the mechanics of 1911. And so, like right now, you know, uh, the guns that'll be tested for the remainder of the year are, will be tested in a wide range of environments. You know, everything from, you know, FBI Quantico all the way to Sunderland's grandma, right? Mm-hmm. Because, you know, you need data. You know, that's what we live by. And by the way, if something doesn't work, it won't work. It will either make it work right or walk away from an idea. We can do that. 
Um, but you need a broad range of shooters to really, you know, yeah. vet something thoroughly. I mean, product development is extremely expensive to do. Yeah. Uh, you know, I could always help you guys out if you need someone to send some Cabot guns to to shoot, you know, for testing purposes. <laughs> Yeah, you know, just let me know. <laughs> It'll be nine millimeter. You okay with that? Nine millimeter? That's fine. Yeah. Yeah. I don't. I don't discriminate. I don't discriminate. Nine forty-five. It's all good. <laughs> it's all good. Uh, okay. So Tyvin Show is gonna probably strangle me if I don't ask this. He mm -hmm. says, um, "Is iron sights the only option you guys have? Can we run RMRs or mount a rail for a small scope on the nineteen elevens that you guys make?" So. Yeah, there's mounts made out there that uh, fit right in the no backside dovetail. Buy a mount, put your RMR on, yeah. go to town. Yeah, good to go. Okay, yeah. And, and, and we, we have and will build guns on request that want an RMR on it or an optic. Um, you know, we, we've done that. That's usually, you know, just a custom request. Yeah, you don't see that as sacrilege or, or do you, but it, that's up to the customer, obviously. How do you guys see that? Well, you know, we, we've been building bullseye guns for uh, uh, several years, and I mean, we had quite quite a bit of success um, with building bullseye. And I like bullseye because that really comes down to absolute fundamentals of shooting, right? It's one-handed at 25, 50 yards. Your target's 1.7 inches or three inches, right? And um, you know, so we have a team that's competed at Camp Perry, and. Uh, in the last in seven years, we've won first place overall four times by two different shooters. Mm -hmm. And you're competing against, you know, 600 people, uh, the U.S. Army Marksman Shoot Unit, the Marines, like the best of the best. You know, so we've, we've, we've had, you know, a, a very good result demonstrating in, uh, in a practical environment what we knew from the lab in terms of capabilities. So, you know, our, we know our guns are very accurate. Um, but those use like a, a traditional aim point. Um, lately, as we built, you know, a small number of uh, RMRs, I kind of admit, like, you know, <laughs> I, you know, it's 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 kind of fun. Like, I, you know, I, I'm 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 kind of you know warming up to an RMR on a 1911. Okay. It's non-traditional, uh, but I'm surprised how much I've liked it now that I've seen a few on on our guns. Okay, all right. Why? Why are you liking it? Are you getting are you getting older? Are the eyes? You know, yeah, starting to go a little bit. The vision. <laughs> you like you like the it, idea of the dot. It, it it seems different. Okay. It's a variation. I mean, you pick up a gun. It did the dot on like an aim point is highly highly visible. Uh, you know, my eyesight's been deteriorating for the last ten years. I mean, you know, if you tell me look at a fifty yard target, you know, I can kind of see there's a center to it, but I can't even really see it see it see the target properly. Mm -hmm. So it's just like a nice visual, and it's just like a variation, right? You know. Yeah, um, it's a human thing. That's what my that's what the eye doctor says. You get to forty something, apparently. He says, and I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Do you think it's Do you think it's safe for you to be driving, Rob? You know, <laughs> about what a target looks like at fifty yards. <laughs> you driving just seems dangerous. Uh oh. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I can tell you, I've been getting new glasses every year now. Yeah, so. I think R2 knows something that we don't know. Yeah. Do you, do you know something about Rob's driving that we don't know? I've got some really great stories, but I'll keep them to myself. Oh, oh, damn it. I mean, listen, we're we're here, man. Tell us. No? Nah, hey, Hank, can, can we talk about knives for a minute? Oh, sure. Okay. That's a good segue. Yeah. Let's talk knives. <laughs> uh, no, yeah, a, a little... Uh, a uh, project we got involved with is a little bit of a uh, uh, a joint venture, um, so to speak. Is uh, a few years ago, um, uh, we do a, a trade show in Germany every year called the IWA Outdoor Classic, mm -hmm. and, and it's it's the equivalent of a shot show. And by the way, if, if someone's out there as an enthusiast in in the industry, because you have to be within the industry to attend, it's not a consumer show. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a beautiful show. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's very impressive i think it's nicer than shot show um but in any event uh you'll find stuff there you don't see anywhere else and uh uh, uh i think three years ago uh i don't get to go out for a walk often but i went out for a walk and you know i was going to see my favorite knife company which is rockstead a japanese knife company and you know they made some mythical knives that were like 62 rockwell on the hardness sale and i'm a bit, I'm a bit of a like a materials nerd mm -hmm. uh, in that regard and I came across a booth, and they were debuting the very first day of a company called Sandrine Knives. 
And, you know, as I see, I see HRC 71. That's Rockwell 71. I'm looking bullshit. Not possible. And I see tungsten carbide. I go bullshit. That's not possible either. Tungsten carbide is too brittle. But, you know, I go over and uh, uh, they're Italian. I speak Italian. They spoke English too. And, you know, they get a sample of blade. Boom, throw it down on the concrete floor. And I'm thinking, okay, that shouldn't be possible with tungsten carbide. And what they've done is they step back and they go, okay, we want to solve the problem that, you know, knives dull, right? You know, there's a beautiful thing with cutting with a sharp knife, but they dull, every knife dulls. Mm -hmm. And essentially what they did is they invented a new grade of tungsten carbide that has flex in it. And they've essentially created the hardest metal ever made for a knife. And um, uh, so the performance vastly outperforms any steel. And uh, it, it's major innovation in the blade in the industry. So initially, we did a small number of knives with them that were collector grade. You know, we did one where we did the handle here in the U.S. Yeah. It was like a hundred thousand dollar knife. Yeah, I was you know, just show, I was just showing that one. Three quarters of a pound of platinum, three hundred twenty diamonds, right? Yeah. And you know, because the material is very expensive, but the background of Sandrine is a company that for forty years has been working in tungsten carbide for two generations. And they're brilliant. They're geniuses in, in that field. And I know people in the tungsten carbide business here. And uh, now they're moving to the mass market, and they got like a this little thin knife called a TCK. It's a it's a folder. It's a scalpel. It's the sharpest knife you know I've ever cut with. And um, it just the edge retention is insane. I mean, it stays sharp uh, forever. Uh, well, nothing lasts forever, but this is the closest you'll ever come to it on a product made by man. And so it's a really interesting uh, uh, new material to the blade industry. And, you know, so it's just a fun side project that we've been involved with. And, uh, you know, if, if someone hasn't heard about these uh, tungsten carbide blades, uh, it's serious. You know, it's the last innovation I can think of in the blade industry might have been ceramic, which was great, sharp. But you know, brittle. Mm -hmm. uh, but this is an important innovation to the knife industry. Okay. And we're thrilled it happened. You know, just by luck, you know, get involved in it a little bit. Right. So, and then you guys are a distributor for it. You're manufacturing them now. I, I see. Obviously, you have it on the website. Yeah. Yeah. So. No, we we don't. Uh, the blades are manufactured in Italy. Okay. In north of Torino. And uh, I mean, we're primarily acting as a distributor for them, and then we, but then we collaborate on, you know, some knife projects, knife, knife designs. On the collector side, you know, we'll collaborate on, you know, special offerings. Yeah. Uh, the manufacturing and the construction of the blade and materials all in Italy, and uh, uh, the fellow Alessandro who runs that, who's second generation, you know, he started grinding carbide at the age of twelve. At the age of twenty-four, he started running the company, and now, you know, fifteen years later. Uh, even within, and their specialty is, is the industrial cutting blade market. So they're in the industrial razor blade market. So, you know, their blades have cut everything that has touched their life, and whether it's, you know, high speed cutting, uh, it's used for cardboard, paper, glass, right? And so they've developed, you know, the science of the angles, the edges, working material uh, on a global perspective for the industrial cutting blade market. Mm -hmm. It's used in high manufacturing. And now they brought it to the uh, consumer market, and it's here by sheer will. They don't need to be doing this, you know. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I love nothing better when people say something cannot be done, and somebody does it. Yeah. And everybody said this was not possible. So if you like knives, this is you know really really cool and innovative. Yeah, there's some great selections on here. I'm looking through the uh, website right now. So that one you have is the tick. Just for was that was that it? Did I say it wrong? TCK? Um, I don't know. TCK. Okay, you know, TCK. All right. Yeah. Knife. Okay. And, TCK. Uh, yeah. No, they're they're going to be evolving. You're going to see more product coming out. In fact, at the uh, last German show, uh, we were there with them, and uh, they developed. So after, I'll, I'll give you an example of speed of innovation. Shot show this year. Mm -hmm. we were there, and it's so, okay. Great. We had this really nice folder. We, um, we want something else. On the way home, um, Alessandro thought, I need something innovative. So I went back and told his engineer, I want you to make a folding knife, no screws. Hmm. Okay. And so when you don't <laughs> come from an industry, you can imagine there's no limits. There's mm -hmm. no tradition. 
And so at uh, in Germany two months ago, they debuted a folding knife with no screws. That's and interesting. Ingenious. I mean, if you look at it, it looks like a stylized lipstick. And if you can, if you can imagine a Mont Blanc pen, right? Shorter, fatter, mm -hmm. right? And you open it, you open the blade, and to click it, you 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 turn the hand like you would a pen. Hmm. And uh, it's brilliant. I mean, we had people from the knife industry coming over and say, okay, you know what? This is really innovative thinking. And it's just an example of the type of thought process that has gone into uh, that project from a unique factor. And that will be available later this year, too. So okay. a lot of fun coming. Yeah, I'm looking I'm looking forward to that. That's uh, That sounds pretty cool. You know? Yeah. Um, uh, Joel Mancuso wants to know if you know edge retention statistics offhand. <laughs> I did. Oh, you I do? Did. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, uh, and there's a, there's a good amount of data on it. And so, for example, with the material and industrial cutting purposes, um, uh, they know because, you know, it, it's used in high-speed cutting and it's very controlled circumstances that tungsten carbide can, can cut in industrial. And it's very controlled. It depends what you cut, of course, but can last 20 to 50 times that of steel. Mm -hmm. uh, um, a typical steel knife, a decent steel knife out there, um, there's a standardized test where you cut a 10 millimeter size of rope, how many times before you can still go through perfectly through a sheet of paper without catching an edge, and the typical knife is 175 times. Okay. Uh, this TCK has been tested uh, where it's done that same test 1,540 times. Wow. So that's a factor of 10x. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so that's one controlled environment. So, you know, 10x over a typical knife. And there's some super steel knives that are not really in production that can get up there fairly high. Um, but you can't, you cannot match tungsten carbide. You know, there's, there's irregularities in metal. There's hardening um, characteristics. You know, this is, tungsten carbide is an engineered metal. And so from that, you know, but it's also cost you 20 times that of steel to produce. Mm-hmm. It'll never replace steel knives, but if you're a knife nerd, yeah. you, know, yeah. you know, this is something to really get So, And then about. that TCK that's like 300 bucks is probably the most affordable way you can get into something like that. Yeah, then. no, so, there, there's uh, something. Okay. This one I'm holding up, the okay. difference is the handle material is $149. Oh, really? Okay. So, I mean, this is not, you know, a $30 knife, mm -hmm. but, uh, uh, you know, the accessibility is getting better and uh, will probably continue to uh, uh, get better as well. Um, unlike a lot of producers, you know, the production capacity of what they have, you know, we have a very, very high end uh, shop by any machine shop standard of like how we operate. Like our, our place is like a clean room compared to any gun shop you've ever been to or gun manufacturer. And I've been in, in some of the finest aerospace manufacturers in the world, uh, but their facility is like Star Trek, man. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, their typical grinder is a half a million dollar multi-axis CNC. You know, they're using Zeiss Ultra Prismo, you know, C coordinate measuring machines to verify tolerances. They're working in light band tolerances. So the capabilities even in manufacturing a blade compared to the, you know, the knife industry is at an entirely different level. And this is in Italy? Yeah, oh, yeah, it's cool. north of uh, Torino. Oh, cool. uh, very, very, very impressive stuff. And I, you know, and I like the fact, you know, please, uh, first of all, I'm made in USA. You know, like, <laughs> this is what Cabot's all about. Uh, but you know, I respect what they're doing, and you know, it's not China, that's for sure. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it, it's it's really neat stuff. So, can the uh, Rat Ride One wants to know if the knife could be sharpened by an average person? Well, you know, you, you know, bear in mind, you know. You know, you can take the back of this knife and sharpen your steel knife. So it's very, very hard. The only thing harder than tungsten carbide is is diamonds. Mm -hmm. So you can use a diamond sharpener to, to sharpen tungsten carbide. Um, but, you know, it takes a certain finesse to sharpen any knife, whether it's a steel knife or a tungsten carbide knife. A tungsten carbide will be harder to resharpen than a steel knife for sure. Uh, but the benefit is, you know, with with everyday uses. I mean, I've been using this. To cut, I cut boxes with it every single day. This morning, you know, I missed spot shaving, and I shaved with it. Oh wow! So Ooh, it's I mean, like a samurai sword, or that, both, it, probably, probably yeah, but, more than that. But my point is, the edge retention with normal use is it, it, likely many, many years. So the whole point, you don't have to sharpen your knife. You know, I mean, you can abuse a knife, just like you can abuse tungsten carbide. 
uh, but the you know, but a knife that the purpose of a knife should be to cut. Mm-hmm. That's the first purpose of, of a knife. And so from a cutting perspective, uh, this is like, you know, somebody's been making a car that has a capability of, you know, sixty miles per hour and all of a sudden there's a car that goes six hundred miles an hour. You know? Mm-hmm. Like this is pretty transformational in yeah. the first Sign first. me up. Sign me up. No, uh, it's, it's fun stuff. Yeah. Okay. So let's see. Before we get out of here, Armament and Axes gave us a couple of bucks. He says, "Hank, guitar behind R two? Question mark? Question mark? Guitar guitar guy here. Laugh out loud." So Armament and Axes, of course, is a guitar guy. So he wants to know what you got back there, R two. Oh, oh, Gibson. Fantastic. Yes. Nineteen eighty seven Les Paul Standard. Ooh. Ten point two pounds. Eighty seven. A good year. A good year. How many? What? How much is it? How many pounds? Ten point two. Oh, okay. Very nice. Very nice. So, uh, can you play that thing, or is that just there for like show? <laughs> can I play this thing? Yeah, yeah. I play. I'm, I'm, I'm not asking for me. I'm asking for a friend. There we go. Oh, oh okay. Come on now. <laughs> That's it. That's all we got. <laughs> The computer's sitting on a Marshall, and I don't know how you'd be able to hear anything. Yeah, yeah. Oh, no, that's cool. That's cool. It's always good to see that kind of stuff. Are you into uh, musical instruments as well? R1? Uh, yeah, when I was younger, I, I played um, uh, saxophone was my main instrument. Okay. And, uh, you know, I, I played in a band for several years. We recorded to some extent. We had some airplay in, you know, the college stations. Okay. Uh, um yeah, but that you know that was quite quite a while back. Yeah. Um, Did you, you ever know, pick up circular breathing? Can you do the circular breathing thing? I don't know what that is. Oh, okay. That's when like you can breathe and at the same time blow out a note. No, but you know I I you know I like uh, I'm not a good harmonica player, but you know there are guys out there that you know can manipulate breath in a way like holy cow, man! You know they're playing tune and melody and chords all at the same time and so you know the manipulation of the air you know from from the mouth is uh i've, I've seen some some musicians that like yeah yeah it's, insane. it's, yeah, it's insane. amazing yeah it's amazing Do you play the gang uh you, no no i can't read me i do i make music but it's all electronic yeah. everything i know it has to be done in a computer yeah, that's how. That's yeah. We've been we've been toying around with putting together putting together maybe a Cabot band, you know. Oh, okay. I could be but the front I, man. I could. Yeah, you know, I could rap. R two huh? plays guitar. Yeah. You know, we have a guy who comes in part time when he doesn't tour. Who plays who plays bass guitar. So we, we need a singer. Okay, I, I could be your front guy. Yeah. You know, I got the mohawk, everything going. You know, Babyface will be my hype man. Do a oh little, God! Okay, a little, little bit of rapping, a little bit of singing. <laughs> I've always wanted to have like a like a classic hip hop band. You oh know, like yeah, some some tone yeah. low, you know, some stuff like that. Yeah, man, I'm down so with that. Some... Yeah, yeah, you know, all all good yeah. favorites. I'm from I'm from the '80s. All that stuff. Yeah, too. yeah, you know, absolutely, I'm down with that. Yeah. yeah, we get it, we get into some heavy debates over guitar players and styles. I mean, no, we yeah. we, look, we love that stuff. Yeah, you know, yeah. now that I think about it. Next time we hire somebody, let's uh, find out if they play drums because that's another. Uh, yeah, that's what I was. Well, I was just gonna say, look out for the drummers, man. I don't do. Yeah, you, <laughs> the drummers are the guys that always start all the trouble. You know, those are always the guys that start the trouble. Just look at your rock history. Yeah, I just got one big question though. Uh huh. Rob, when you were playing saxophone in Canada, did you guys ever do a cover of Men at Work? Who can it be now? <laughs> <laughs> okay. One for you guys. Can it be? <laughs> <laughs> we did that. Huh? No, you did it. You didn't do it. Okay. All right. Oh, cool. Come on, man. Yeah, he probably did it. He probably did it. You know. Quarter um, flash. <laughs> big one. Yeah, <laughs> lots of good sax, man. Sax was the thing. Eighties, uh, nineties, you know, that was uh, that was big. All right, listen, we've gone over nine o'clock. We've done more than two hours. We could probably keep going here, but uh, you know, you guys have uh, been troopers. You've hung out. Yeah, let's show some more guns before we go, Rob. What guns do you have there? 
Well, I mean, I, we don't need to go over time, but, yeah. you know, I, maybe I'll show you just a couple very quickly. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, this was the vintage classic that we talked about before. Uh, okay, yeah. An idea. I like that um, shield that's on the grip there. That looks good. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it's a yeah. little uh, shield we developed. Yeah. Uh, uh, this is a model called the Gran Torino. Gran Torino. So embellished okay. with uh, racing stripes you'd find on the classic. Uh, yeah. On the, on the car. Stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we talked about our standard, you know, uh, entry level pistol, which is a really high quality 911 called the S100. Mm -hmm. I like the wood on that one. What was that? Uh, what was that? What kind of wood was that? Uh... Yeah, this, this is a walnut. Walnut. And okay. The design on the grips themselves, those curves, are based on a um, on the linear sequence of the Fibonacci number. Yeah, Fibonacci. Yeah, I think I've done a video on that gun on my channel with you. Oh, cool. Yeah. And you know, here's a Damascus pistol, which I call our Zebra Damascus. Damascus. Beautiful pattern on that. And then Kept what? Grips. What's on the grips? They're mammoth ivory. Oh, mammoth ivory. Okay, very cool. Oh. So, uh, this would be a little bit more eccentric, but here is a. Oh, whoa, whoa! That's a long. <laughs> That's got some length. <laughs> so this is also Damascus. Um, nice. The grips on that are a meter, right? Which we didn't talk about too much uh, tonight, but uh, yeah. And then you know, uh, this is a little bit, a little bit practical. This is you know simple and elegant. Okay. Your size with the rail. Is that the, is that a satin finish? No, is it? Um, yeah, PVE finish. Yeah, oh. it, I mean this is a vapor deposition finish of a of you know. In oh. terms of black. We don't we don't do any like the way we build guns. Our, our tolerances are so tight that you can't you couldn't paint a gun. You know, like a Cerakote mm -hmm. still fit there. Um, and then this would be an example of you know a more polished pistol. Mm. Uh, this is a polished upper, and this is done to a two micron hand polish, which is like, dead art. Yeah. Uh, you know, po into, uh, making making a gun shiny versus polishing are two different things. You right. know, polishing to get a flat flat to keep the edges straight, you have to do by hand. It's many many hours. Um, here's a recent custom gun. Uh, oh wow! We, Look at that artwork. So you'll see the um, the grips, for example. These are, you know, those are hand stippled. Wow. You know, this is very individual. Oh, that one but, has Canada. <laughs> yeah, this is for a, uh, a Canadian customer who wanted uh, a couple guns with some king history to okay. it. Did you hide an American flag in there somewhere? <laughs> somewhere else. Uh, yeah, don't... It, it's all American. <laughs> you know, it's, yeah. all, all, it's all American. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I'm not, I'm not knocking it. You know, I'm just saying, we could still, we could still hide an American flag in there. So, oh, there you go. 1911. We talked about briefly. Stars and stripes. Where were these guns this whole time, Rob? Well, you know. Yeah. Like, I, 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 we have quite a few. And by the way, like you know, we're we're domiciled um, in rural Pennsylvania, where we're based. Mm -hmm. And you know, we have I have a vault of. Uh, uh, really beautiful rare materials that we work with and so like going through materials is a lot of fun and then you know we we're not open to the public but i have a private showroom if people want to come in or if they're local or mm -hmm. what happened and then we also have a, uh, a vertically integrated facility in fort wayne indiana uh is where we you know we make all the components and so forth so uh uh, yeah, there's a lot of fun stuff to look at, and maybe on another occasion. Yeah, you know, we'll, we'll do that. Look, uh, yeah, look I'd like to see um, some amber grips with some kind of dinosaur inside of it. Yeah, I, I, I have that. Oh, you do? You do. Oh, see? That's awesome. Baby dinosaur. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the Jurassic Park. Yeah. Huh? A little baby dinosaur <laughs> inside. Yeah. <laughs> Very good, very good. Okay, listen, we're gonna wrap it up, but I, I really enjoyed this. We'll we'll get Rob Bianchin and uh, Rob Shondler. Do I get it right? Shondler. Shondless. 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 Okay. See, that was gonna be my third. 
that was going to be my third option. <laughs> uh, yeah, we'll get we'll get the two Robs to come back on here sometime and uh, talk about more 1911s. I know this is the first time, so it's just getting to know these guys. Uh, let me drop the end here. Don't go anywhere, guys. I'm just going to drop the end, and then I'll come back with some final words on the folks. Thanks to everyone that's been hanging out with us. I know we went over time. Make sure you subscribe. Make sure you thumbs up all that good stuff ring the bell so you could be notified all right guys if anyone out here wants to get in touch with you or find more info what can they do how can they how can they uh get in contact with you guys you know everybody knows google you know find us cabotguns.com contact info's on there okay. uh do you know feel free you know you know even if you're not a, you know someone's gonna buy one of our guns uh if you love american art and we're in the golden age of 1911s uh, check out our website and our Oak page of unique work. There's some uh, uh, fine examples of our work. Yeah, and Alchemy Wep uh, Alchemy Custom Weaponry is the other, the other one, right? Follow us on Instagram. Follow me on Instagram if you like weightlifting, beer drinking, guitar playing. <laughs> you know that kind of crap. Fast cars. Oh, you know. Yeah, done. <laughs> done. You like it? What's uh, your Instagram? You What's your Instagram, R2? Rob Schalland. Rob Schalland, no, okay. It's not. No? It's official RCSJR. Official? Okay, hold on. Now, this one I'm going to have to go to right now, otherwise it won't. It Dude, won't. I don't post very often. I'm just jerking oh. your chain. Okay. Uh, I, was, I was just about to go over there. All right. You talk photos, that kind of crap. Yeah. And if, you, if you want to see unique stuff from Cabot, it's not on the website. Instagram is uh, is what we use on a daily basis. Yeah, you guys have a pretty good Instagram following. Yeah, Cabot Guns. Okay, make sure you check that out. What about you, Babyface? How can the people um, keep Same up old, same old. Ba uh, baby underscore face P on Instagram and baby face P on YouTube. And I promise I have some stuff coming out. The weather here in Florida has been horrendously hot. So it's been keeping me from working in the garage the last couple of days, but hopefully when it'll cool down a little bit, maybe yeah, uh, I'll have to work in the evenings. It's been 105 for anybody that's curious, so yeah. it's been stupidly hot. Yeah, you better hurry but, up. Uh, We're going into hurricane uh, season. I know. Well, I'd rather have some rain than, than the heat. <laughs> yeah, get it, get it done. But that's me. Yeah, get it done. All right, I want to thank everyone for joining us. Make sure you check out Cabot Guns um, and then uh, also Alchemy Custom uh, Weaponry. You guys are, are on... Um, you're on the social medias as well, separately, right? Yeah, we've got the Instagram as well. Okay, very cool. Check out Babyface P, check out Hank Strange, and the Who Moved My Freedom podcast is on the WMMF podcast. You guys can find it there. We are out of here. Thanks very much to everyone. Thanks a lot, Rob and Rob, for coming on. We really appreciate it for you guys coming on and hanging out with us. We are out of here. Thanks to everyone. Peace. Oh, by the way, um... No show tomorrow or Friday. I got to take some days off, get some work done. So we'll see you guys. We're out of here. Yeah, I, I waited till the end to say that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get in trouble. There's going to be lots of text to me going on right now about that one. So that's why I waited. Huh? Getting some work done. Yeah, that's why I waited till the end so that no one can complain while we're doing the show. <laughs> see you guys. We're out.